Okay, if we're live now, <clears throat> what we might do is maybe have just, I think maybe we only need four microphones for the afternoon session. So we'll have uh, two on each side, one toward the back, one toward the front, and we'll just go around in, in four microphones. Are we okay on that? And we'll start just one second. Everybody has a chance to get to their seats. Charlie has promised to stop tapping the uh, Coke can during this <laughs> session. <laughs> I only did that when somebody else was talking. <laughs> Number two? <laughs> okay, Charlie. I used to have a friend that was a stock salesman many years ago, and when you'd have lunch with him, he would just keep going like this. And finally, it would get to you and you say, what's that? And he'd say, that's opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty good. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, Kelly tells me we should start with, uh, with number two, uh, zone two. So we're going to start with zone two. Yes, I'm uh, Fred Cooker from Boulder, Colorado. And uh, this is a question about intrinsic value, and it's a question for both of you because you have written that perhaps you would come up with uh, different answers. You uh, write and speak a great deal about intrinsic value, um, and you indicate that you try to give shareholders the tools in the annual report so they can come to their own determination. What I'd like you to do is expand upon that a little bit. <clears throat> First of all, what, uh, what do you believe to be the important tools, either in the Berkshire Annual Report or other annual reports that you review uh, in determining intrinsic value? And secondly, what rules or principles or standards do you use in applying those tools? And lastly, how does that process, that is, the use of the tools, the application of the standards, relate to what you have previously described as the filters uh, you use in determining your valuation of a company? If we uh, could see, in it looking at any business, what its future cash inflows or outflows from the business to the owners or from the owners would be over the next, we'll call it a hundred years or until the business is extinct, and then could discount that back at the appropriate interest rate, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, that would give us a number for intrinsic value. In other words, it would be like looking at a bond that had a whole bunch of coupons on it that was due in 100 years. And if you could see what those coupons are, you can figure the value of that bond compared to government bonds if you want to stick an appropriate risk rate in. Uh, or you can compare one government bond with 5% coupons to another government bond with 7% coupons. Each one of those bonds has a different value because they have different coupons printed on them. Businesses have coupons that are going to develop in the future, too. The only problem is they aren't printed on the instrument, and it's up to the investor to try to estimate what those coupons are going to be over time. As we have said in high-tech businesses or something like that, we don't have the faintest idea what the coupons are going to be. When we get into businesses where we think we can understand them reasonably, well, we are trying to print the coupons out. We are trying to figure out what businesses are going to be worth in 10 or 20 years. When we bought C's Candy in 1972, we had to come to the judgment as to whether we could figure out the competitive forces that would operate the strengths and weaknesses of the company and, and how that would look over a 10 or 20 or 30 year period. And if you attempt to assess intrinsic value, it, it all relates to cash flows. The only reason for putting cash into any kind of an investment now is because you expect to take cash out, not by selling it to somebody else, because that's just a game of who beats who but by, in a sense, by what the asset itself produces. That's true if you're buying a farm, it's true if you're buying an apartment house, it's true if you're buying a business. And the filters you described, we're, there, there are a number of filters 
which say to us, we don't know what that business is going to be worth in, in, in 10 or 20 years, and we can't even make an educated guess. Obviously, we don't think we know to three decimal places or two decimal places or anything what, uh, like that what precisely what's going to be produced. But we have a high degree of confidence that we're in the ballpark with certain kinds of businesses. The filters are designed to make sure we're in those kinds of businesses. We basically use long-term, risk-free, let's government bond type interest rates to think back in terms of what we should discount at. Uh, and you know that's that's what the game of investment is all about. Investment is putting out money to get more money back later later on from the asset, and and not by selling it to somebody else, but by what the asset itself will produce. If you're an investor. You're looking at what the asset you're looking at what the asset is going to do, in our case businesses. If you're a speculator, you're primarily focusing on what the price of the object is going to do, independent of the business. And uh, that's not our game. So we figure if we're right about the business, we're gonna make we're gonna make a lot of money. And if we're wrong about the business, we don't have any hopes. We we, we don't expect to make money. And and in looking at Berkshire, we try to tell you as much as possible as we can about our business, of the key factors. Those are the things that Charlie and I, well, the things we put in our report about those businesses are the things that we look at ourselves. Uh, so if Charlie had nothing to do with Berkshire, but he looked at our report, he would probably, in my view, uh, he would come to pretty much the same idea of intrinsic value that he would come to uh, from being around it, you know, for X number of years. Uh, the information should be there. We give you the information that if the positions were reversed, we would want to get from you. And in companies like Coca-Cola or Gillette or Disney or those kind of businesses, you will see the information in the reports. You have to have some understanding of what they're doing, but you have that in your everyday activities. You'll get that. You'll get that kind of knowledge. Uh, you won't get it, you know, in terms of some high-tech company, but you'll get it with those kind of companies. And then you sit down and you you try to print out the future, Charlie. I would argue that one filter that's useful in investing is the simple idea of opportunity cost. If you have one opportunity that you already have available in large quantity and you like it better than 98% of the other things you see, well, you can just screen out the other 98% because you already know something better. So that people who have a lot of opportunities tend to make better investments than people that don't have a lot of opportunities and, and people who have very good opportunities and using a concept of opportunity cost, they can make better decisions uh, about what to buy. With this attitude, you get a concentrated portfolio, which we don't mind. That practice of ours, which is so simple, is not widely copied. I do not know why. Now it's copied among the Berkshire shareholders. I mean, all of you people have learned it, but it's not the standard in investment management, even at great universities and other intellectual institutions. You, you, Very interesting question. If, if we're right, why are so many eminent places so wrong? <laughs> there are several possible answers to that yes. question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, the attitude, though, I mean, if, if somebody shows us a business, you know, the first thing that goes through our head is, would we rather own this business than more Coca-Cola? Would we rather own it than more Gillette? You know, we, it's, it's crazy not to compare it to things that you're very certain of. There's very few businesses that we'll find that we're as certain of the future about as, as, as companies such as that. And therefore, we will we will want companies where the certainty gets close to that, uh, and then we'll want to figure that uh, we're better off than just buying more of those. If every management, uh, before they bought a business uh, in some unrelated field that they might not have even heard of, you know, more than a short time before that's being promoted to them, if they said, "Is this better than buying in our own stock?" You know, "Is this better than even buying, you know, buying Coca-Cola stock or something?" They'd, There'd be a lot fewer deals done, but but they don't. They, they tend not to measure. Uh, we, we try to measure against what we regard as as close to perfection as we can get. Charlie, anyone? 
well i will say this that the concept of intrinsic value used to be a lot easier because there were all kinds of stocks that were selling for fifty percent or less of the amount at which you could have easily liquidated the whole corporation if you owned the whole corporation indeed in the history of berkshire hathaway we bought things at twenty percent of of then liquidating value and in the old days the ben graham followers could run their geiger counters over corporate america and they could spill out a few things and you could easily see if you were at all familiar with the market prices of, of whole corporations that you were buying at a huge discount. Well, no matter how bad the management, if you're buying at 50% of asset value or 30% or so on down, you have a lot going for you. And, uh, and as the world has wised up and as stocks have behaved so well for people, that stocks generally have gone to higher and higher prices, that game gets much harder. Now to find something at a discount from intrinsic value, those simple systems ordinarily don't work. You've got to get into Warren's kind of thinking, and that is a lot harder. I think you can predict the future in a few places best if you understand a few basic ideas that come from a good general education. And, uh, and that's what I was talking about in that talk I gave at the USC Business School. In other words, Coca-Cola is a simple company if it's stripped down and analyzed in terms of some elemental forces. It's not hard to understand Costco either, you know, yeah. I mean, it, there are certain fundamental models out there that do not take, you don't have the kind of ability that quantum mechanics requires. You just have to know a few simple things and really know them. When Charlie talks about liquidating, now he's not talking about closing up the enterprise, but he's talking about what somebody else would pay for that stream of cash, too. I mean, yeah. it, 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 you could have looked at a collection of television stations uh, owned by a, a Cap Cities, for example, in the in the early, to, well, 1974, and it would have been worth, we'll say, four times what the company was selling for. Uh, not because you'd close the stations, but just their, their stream of income was worth that to somebody else. It's just that the marketplace was uh, very depressed, depressed, although, like I say, on a negotiated basis, you could have gone and sold the properties for four times what the, the company was selling for, and you got wonderful management. And I mean, those things happen in markets. They will happen again. At, uh, uh, but part of part of investing and calculating intrinsic values is if you get the wrong answer when you get through, in other words, if it says don't buy, you can't buy just because somebody else thinks it's going to go up or because your friends have made a lot of easy money lately or anything of the sort. You just you have to be able to uh, to walk away from anything that doesn't work, and and very few things work these days. You also have to work walk away from anything you don't understand, which in my case is a big handicap. But you would agree, wouldn't you, Warren, that it's much harder now? Yeah, but I would also agree that almost at any time over the last 40 years that we've been up on a podium, we would have said it was much harder in the past, too. <laughs> but it, it is harder now. It's way harder. It, but part, of, part of it being harder now, too, is, is the amount of capital we run. I mean, if, if we were running $100,000, our prospects for returns would be, and, and, and we really needed the money, our prospects for return would be considerably better than they are. Uh, running Berkshire. It's just, it's, it's very simple. Our universe of possible ideas would expand by a huge factor. We are looking at things today that, by their nature, a lot of people have to, are looking at. And, and there were times in the past when we were looking at things that very few people were looking at. But there were other times in the past when we were looking at things where the whole world was just looking at them kind of crazy. And, and, and that, that's a decided help. Zone three. My name, my name is Bakul Patel. I am from upstate New York. I have got a few questions, and I need your permission to ask each question separately and wait for the answer. Well, we'll, we'll take a couple, but, but uh, yeah. I got through college, you know, only answering three or four questions, so I don't, <laughs> don't want to go through that again. <laughs> they, are, they are unrelated questions. Okay, okay. okay. We'll give you a couple, then we'll let other people okay. have a chance. How about two, okay? okay? Fine. 
Mr. Market is valuing Dow Jones at seven th above 7,000 and S&P at above 800. By your valuation model, at the current interest rate and current inflation rate and current growth rate, what is the fair valuation of both these, both these companies? No. Well, that's, that's, that's a good question, but a tough question. But I would say that if you believed American, the, the American uh, business in aggregate could earn the kind of returns on equity that they have been earning in the last, or it has in the last couple of years, and then you postulate no change in interest rates, you can justify uh, 7,000 on the Dow and 800 on the S&P. Now, you know, there's, there's a couple ifs I threw in there, and if interest rates go higher, the valuation goes down automatically. Uh, and more importantly, if the returns on equity of American industry, which are at historic highs, uh, and which sort of classical economics would tell you would be hard to maintain, if those returns go down on average, that also would pull it down. But if, 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 if you're willing to accept the current level of returns on equity as being typical of the future case for American business and you're willing to assume present interest rates are lower, then you can justify a valuation uh, on the Dow and S&P. And, and it's interesting, I because I got all that commentary after I wrote that line in the report, which was, as I said earlier, designed for a little something else. Uh, I'll give you a little trivia quiz. What what two years in this century has the Dow had the greatest overall gain? Uh, the two years uh, in the 1900s are 1933, which most of you don't think of as a banner year, but uh, and 1954. And in both of those years, the Dow was up over 50 percent, counting dividends. In March of 1955, because of that, the fact that the Dow had gone up, bear in mind that the high on the Dow was 381 in 1929, and it took 25 years before that was, was uh, surpassed. And in 1954, the Dow went from, say, 280 up to 404, something like that, just a little over 50 percent. So what did they decide to do? They decided to have congressional hearings about it. And uh, they did. In March of 1955, they had hearings in the Senate Banking and Currency Committee, Chairman Fulbright, and my boss, Ben Graham, was called down to testify. And it's fascinating reading. Bernard Baruch was there, all, all kinds of people. But I've, got, I've got the hearings at home. And uh, Ben's opening comments about the market at that time were the, the market looks high, it is high, but it's not as high as it looks. Well, That's about the present situation. I mean, it, it, it looks very high just by comparing 7,000, certainly to the 404 at the end of 1954 when Ben was testifying. But uh, there are, there have been huge changes in, in earnings and return on equity on, on American business in general, and then you've had this big move in interest rates. Now, those are underlying fundamentals that have had a powered a huge bull market. After a while, as I mentioned earlier, people get captivated simply by the notion of rising prices without going back to the underlying rationale, and that's when you get very dangerous conditions in terms of possible bubbles. Uh, and it would, you know, it, it, I have no idea where markets will go, but it, you, you have the con kind of conditions that uh, could cause real excesses, just like you had excesses in, in 1973 and four. Going back to when you could buy things at 20 cents on the dollar, you had excesses in the other direction. You know, the country didn't disappear or anything. It's just people behave in extreme ways in markets. And over time, that's very good for people that keep their heads. Charlie? Uh, I've got nothing to add. Hmm. Okay, get one more. <laughs> oh. if, if Mr. Market goes in a depressed phase, that Berkshire Hathaway has got an investment portion of its mark book value about 28,000 per class A share. That would put the Berkshire Hathaway share much lower than what it is now. Would Berkshire Hathaway consider buying back its own share, or has it done it so in past, or is it out of the question? If the market went in the tank, Berkshire stock would go, go in the tank too. And so there shouldn't be anybody in this room that owns the stock that 
would not find it palatable if not become positively enthusiastic about the stock going down 50%. It, uh, it, it, would not bother, it would not bother Charlie, it wouldn't bother me, because we would have very intelligent things then to do with whatever capital we came into, and we would, we would be generating capital as we went along. We wouldn't have sold our Coke, we wouldn't have sold our Gillette, we wouldn't have sold our businesses, so most of our capital would have ridden that down, but at least we would have intelligent things to do with the money. One of the intelligent things possibly we could be to buy in our own stock, but that would imply that our own stock was cheaper relative uh, to value than anything else we could find among possible opportunities. And the chances are we could find things that were more attractive. Back in 1973 or 4, when we were buying Washington Post, a fraction of what it was worth, Berkshire stock may have been cheap then, but it wasn't as cheap as the Washington Post. In 1987 or, uh, well, it was in 1988 and 89, you know, Berkshire stock may or may not have been cheap, but it wasn't as cheap as Coca-Cola. And it's unlikely that among the thousands of possible investments that Berkshire will be the most attractive at any time. But if it were, you know, obviously we would, we would uh, uh, buy in our own stock. But I think if the Dow went down 50 percent, uh, we would have plenty of interesting things to do. And we would not be unhappy. Uh, uh, Charlie? Yeah, we, we don't have any rule against it. If, if opportunity cost is the game around here. Zone four. I'm David Day from Coppell, Texas, and I'm a Berkshire shareholder. Mr. Buffett, what is your opinion of investing in foreign company stocks? Well, we uh, we have a number. Well, at least several major businesses, three or four at least, five, six, as I count along, uh, that derive very significant percentages of their earnings from international, uh, from the international operations. Coca-Cola earns 80 percent or more uh, uh, from international operations. Gillette would earn two-thirds or more from international operations. So if you look to where our look through earnings are coming from, we get a lot from international companies. They don't have to be domiciled uh, outside the United States. It's a slight advantage to us to have them domiciled in this country. For example, their dividends are treated better. Uh, we get better treatment on the dividends if they are domestically uh, uh, based rather than based someplace else just because of the way the U.S. tax laws work. Uh, but if Coca-Cola were domiciled in, in Amsterdam or Gillette were domiciled in London, they had the same basic businesses, we would be attracted to them uh, to the, virtually the same degree we are as having them domiciled in Atlanta and Boston. Uh, we look at businesses outside this country that are domiciled outside this country. Uh, many don't meet our size requirements, but that's true here too. But they're, they're, we have to look at very big companies. But we have nothing against buying company, buying into companies that are domiciled, or even buying the entire business of a company that's uh, uh, domiciled outside the United States. Uh, we feel slightly less familiar with uh, the tax laws and the and the uh, corporate culture, cultures, perhaps. But that would not be a huge factor in a great many countries. And. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, will, we will keep looking. We need, we need to look everywhere with the kind of money that, that we have available for investment. Charlie? Again, we've, we've had a wonderful way of playing the rapid development of economies outside the United States. And uh, so far, we haven't seen anything that attracted us as being better. I mean, if you can sell Coca-Cola, you know, do you really want to get into steel in Malaysia or something? We, we, we sold a substantial number of Kirby uh, units outside of uh, the United States last year, and that business has grown uh, very significantly in recent years, and I think it'll, it promises to grow more. We're always looking for opportunities. Some, some things travel very well, and some things don't. I, I mean, uh, Gillette travels, Disney travels, McDonald's travels, Coke travels. You know, uh, C's candy doesn't travel as well. It, 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 uh, it, it might if you spent 50 years working on it, but it, it, it's not an easy thing to, uh, to travel. I mean, actually, candy bars themselves don't travel 
very well. If you look at the top selling candy bars in France or in, or in England uh, and Japan, you, you, you don't find the similarity that you find in terms of the best selling soft drinks or, or movies uh, uh, or fast food hamburgers or, or, or uh, uh, razor blades. And Except Snickers. For some reason, Snickers. Yeah, well. It travels very well. Don't yeah. ask me why. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Charlie's had a lot of experience as he goes around the world. <laughs> you don't want to eat where we eat. You may want to invest where we invest. But <laughs> Okay, section one. I'm uh, Richard Tompkins from uh, Gallatin, Tennessee, and uh, I have just two quick questions. Uh, could both of y'all discuss uh, the Kansas bankers' business and its uh, competitors? how big of a moat uh, Kansas Bankers has in the industry, and if they're gonna expand you know, outside of the 22 or 20 states that they're currently in. That's A. And then uh, secondly, just clue us in a little bit more on the uh, five-year discount notes that you did that were tied to the Solomon stock, and was that a way to unload it, or just kind of give us a little more than what we saw in the annual. Sometimes in the insurance business, you have a choice between being a good business or a big business. And, and uh, fortunately, Don uh, Toll, who runs Kansas Banker Surety, has chosen for a good business. Uh, it's a specialized operation that sells, as its name implies, to bankers, uh, and primarily policies that, uh, that uh, have fidelity coverage. And that is just not a big volume business in the, in the whole United States. They do it exceptionally well. Don knows every, uh, you know, he knows every account, he knows every claim. He, you know, he, it, 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 he runs a fabulous operation, but it's not an operation that, that uh, uh, can double or triple in size, uh, uh, doing what it does and doing well. It, there just aren't, there's not the opportunity there. On the other hand, I, I think it's, uh, it's tough to compete against Don because he brings an element of, of knowledge and personal attention to the account and factors of that sort that that a really large company would have tr trouble duplicating. Uh, uh, Charlie, you want to add anything on Kansas Bank? Yeah, there's a huge class of businesses in America which are very strong and will throw out large amounts of cash in relation to their size, but which can't rationally be expanded very much. And uh, if you try and expand certain kinds of businesses, you're throwing mon money down the rat hole. The beauty of the Berkshire Hathaway system is that such businesses are very welcome here because the cash comes into headquarters and is allocated there. Uh, if there's anything sensible to do at the subsidiary level, why we always want it done, but, but there are businesses where, lots of businesses, where there, there isn't much of a way of of, uh, redeploying the cash. Part of the reason they have a moat around them is that, is that they're of a size and have specialized skills that other organizations just can't get into it. I'll give you another example, and it's somewhat same field. There's a company called Western Surety. It's, it's changed ownership a couple of times. Charlie and I went up to see him 15 years ago by buying it at Sioux Falls. They write notary bonds, and they, uh, they write a whole bunch of things that have $50 premiums or $25 premiums. They have there was a company doing not that many millions of premiums, but they had 30,000 agents. But each agent, you know, may have done $500 worth of business with them a year or $1,000. Well, Chubb can't go after that business the same way. We certainly can at National Indemnity. They have a distribution system that works wonders. But you can't pump two or three times the volume through that distribution system. And if you could pump it through, there would have been more competition. So there are, there, there are businesses that have certain natural limits that... Uh, uh, you know, you want, you want to be careful that you don't talk yourself into thinking a business that has limits uh, and, and find out that it, that it uh, really has way more potential. I mean, it would have been a shame if Mr. Candler decided that Coca-Cola only appealed to people in Atlanta or something of the sort. So you got to be a little careful on that. But we, uh, a fellow like Don will be very good at understanding, you know, where his competitive advantages can take him and where they don't take him. He's done a terrific job over the years doing it. There was a second question, was there? No. Just the, uh, the 
five hundred million, I think, that y'all did uh, of the oh, discount. The Solomon oh, the Solomon notes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is simply an issue of Berkshire by Berkshire of uh, five hundred million, as you mentioned, of a very low coupon note, uh, low interest rate note too, uh, that is convertible or exchangeable into uh, Solomon stock anytime during the next five years, and it's a way of taking the capital out of that block of stock at a, at a low interest cost to use elsewhere while retaining a limited portion of the upside in the Solomon stock. And we just we made that decision uh, um, whenever it was six months ago or so based on the thought that we might have some good opportunities at some point to uh, use that money and raising the money at a little over a 1% current cost or a 3% cost to maturity, and we think the actual cost is likely to be close to the 1%, uh, made sense for us. Uh, we have never owned, I mean, we, we had the convertible preferreds of Champion, of U.S. Airways, and of uh, Solomon, and those are three industries. Uh, I don't think we've ever owned an airline stock, common stock. I don't think we've ever owned a paper company, common stock, and we've only had a very limited amount of investment in, in the investment banking businesses. Those are industries that we don't feel that we've got the same kind of long-term economic advantage that we have in something like a Coke or a Gillette. So those are not natural places for us to be common shareholders. And the issuance of that uh, exchangeable debt reflected that view. Charlie? I agree. <laughs> Okay, zone two. My name is Kristen Schramm. I am from Springfield, Illinois. I am a proud shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway. In light of the upcoming capital gains tax reduction, do you envision any increased selling pressure such as buying opportunities for Berkshire stock? Oh, that's a good question, Christine. We're, we're proud to have you, too. <clears throat> a, very, a very high percentage of Berkshire shares uh, is owned by people with a very low tax basis, so that uh, if I had to guess, I would say that uh, probably uh, 80% at least of the shares are owned by people whose cost is less than $100 a share on the A stock. And uh, that undoubtedly contributes to some people's reluctance uh, to sell, particularly if they're older. Uh, and, but I, I think it, would it might make less difference than you think. I think, I think most people, if there were a lower, in, lower uh, capital gains rate, I, I don't think it would be a a huge change in in uh, the propensity to uh, sell the stock. I, I, I would hope, even if there was a zero capital gains tax, that that uh, there really wouldn't be any rush for the exits. Uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't affect my attitude uh, particularly, but I think it, it's it's perfectly reasonable to assume that as the tax rate goes down, there will be some greater tendency to sell by people with a low tax basis on their shares. Charlie? Well, I think the laws of microeconomics and the laws of psychology are such that if you said the tax rate will, for one month, go down to zero, you would have some very dramatic effects in, in the markets. It's not going to happen, of course. No, but if you said the tax rate was going to zero for one month and then going to 100 percent subsequently, I think you'd get a certain amount of activity. Well, then you'd really. <laughs> So you could tinker with the tax laws in a way that would cause dramatic market effects. I don't anticipate any such things happening. We had something similar back when they, uh, what was it, 86? Mm -hmm. uh, where and the tax rate was 20% on long-term capital gains, and, and it was the last year you could uh, liquidate a corporation and not pay gains taxes on appreciated assets that were disposed of in the liquidation. And, and we got a great 
flood of liquidations in that year. So it's possible to do things to the tax laws that have big market effects. I think it's very unlikely that any such thing is going to happen this year. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Zone two. What number is this? Is there a zone two? Is this it? The microphone working? Oh, zone three? Well, we'll go to zone three then. That's what they I am, I am Charles Parcells from Gross Point, Michigan. Very glad to be here. I'm a recent stockholder of Berkshire. I'm sorry to say that, uh, <laughs> but it does not diminish my admiration for past performance or my confidence in future performance. I heard recently a remark by, I think, a very successful investor, whom I think worked with the Bass family in Texas for a while, and one of his comments, if I understand it correctly, said something like this. Um, Hurricane Andrew destroyed the super cat industry. And that's about all he said, and I know we're into it. I'm interested in its importance to Berkshire and your comments on it, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. Yeah, I, I guess I would say I don't fully understand why he would, or even partially understand, why he would say that. I mean, her, we are in business, in the super cat business, and I should explain, super cat business is very much like it sounds. I mean, we, we write insurance for, for other insurance companies, other reinsurance companies, to protect them, to pay them at a time when something really big comes along, a super catastrophe. And Hurricane Andrew was certainly a super catastrophe. But, that, that, but that's, that's the reason people do business with us. So we pay off infrequently, but we pay off big. And we paid off about $120 million uh, at Hurricane Andrew. But if Hurricane Andrew happened today, uh, well, at least when one of the policies in SEPs we have, uh, we would certainly be paying off at least, uh, what, six, seven hundred million, something like that. And if it happens five years from now, we'll pay off a lot more than that because we will undoubtedly be writing more business at that time. So it's just part of the game. Um, and there will be super cats of various kinds. There will be, you know, huge quakes. There will be, there will be more hurricanes than huge quakes. Uh, and when that time comes, we will write a big check. But that doesn't, uh, you know, prices may be firmer after such an event. They may not be. Uh, they didn't firm as much as you might expect uh, after Andrew happened. Andrew was a huge surprise to people. As a, as a digression, you know, people in the, in the insurance business thought that they all had these models, and some of them were prepared by reinsurance brokers and some of them by various research institutes as how much they would lose under certain kinds of circumstances, and they couldn't have been further off uh, with an Andrew uh, or with the Northridge earthquake. Uh, fortunately, we don't we don't rely on those. We uh, I don't know what exactly we do rely on, but we don't rely on those. At, uh, uh, and the Hurricane Andrew was, you know, that was just that's part of business with 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 Berkshire, and we, and we will have another one, and we'll we'll have another one after that. So every three or five or seven years or who knows what. We will, we will lose significant money in the super cat business, and we expect that over 20 or 25 years, we will make more money than we lose. We, uh, we bring some real advantages to that business, as I wrote about in the report, and uh, it makes sense for us to be in it. It only makes sense for us to be in it when the premium prices are right, but when they are, when they are appropriate, uh, uh, we will, we're, we're more than willing to, uh, step up and take on a fair amount of risk. As I wrote in the report on, on, on the California Earthquake Authority, you know, we could tomorrow uh, face a, a demand for roughly a billion dollars, and we are prepared to write a check that day to take care of that, and we will write it if it happens. And there aren't very many people in the world that, that uh, 
uh, an insured can count on uh, to do that. The interesting thing is that the worst exposures still for super cats are not born by us, but they're born implicitly by some very big direct riding companies that have lots of risk on Long Island or uh, along the New Madrid Fault or, or other places. Uh, and they have got, th well, millions of policies and maybe hundreds of thousands of exposed policies. And they don't think of themselves as being in the super cat business, or they really do, but they don't, they don't think you know, day by day about it. And, and they, uh, they are very exposed. Our exposures are limited to a given dollar amount. That dollar amount may be large, but at least we know what it is. And uh, we take risks that we're willing to take risks when we think we're appropriately paid. There's a mentality to bring to the super cat business that's somewhat akin to the, what you bring to the investment business. So we're, we think we're well equipped for it. Charlie? Yeah, uh, the billion dollars would be what, two and a half percent? or less of, of uh, the liquid assets and securities around Berkshire. And uh, so that's irritating, but it <laughs> it's not going to destroy the enterprise. Whereas if you have an unwitting super cat exposure that you don't even recognize you have, it could destroy your company. 20th century, a uh, very well-run direct writer of, of insurance. They all but went broke with the Northridge earthquake. And they didn't think it was possible either. And they had no idea they had a super cat exposure in what they thought was a simple little direct writing insurance operation. Now, I don't think we've got the main super cat risks at all at, at Berkshire. Geico lost something like a, a $150 million in Andrew. And their initial estimate of the loss was like $35 million, and that's after they thought they'd heard about most of it. You can really get fooled in this business. In fact, 20th Century, which lost the billion dollars at Northridge, just in, at the end of 1996, I think, added $40 million, as I remember, to the reserves for the Northridge quake, which I think was in January of 94. Now, you'd think on an earthquake, you would, you know, you'd kind of know when it was over. but. Uh, it, it, you, you can really you can get fooled, and, and down at Andrew, I mean, the costs of construction go up dramatically in an area that's been wiped out. And then there were all kinds of things in the codes. I mean, I think they started requiring architects' drawings on everything, you know, over five thousand dollars in the way of repair, or some number like that. I don't hold me to the number. And of course, the architects had a field day, and and then it turned out that everybody had a homeowner's policy. At, in the Oakland fire, for example, they all had a $300,000 book collection in their library, and you know who knows after the place is burned down. It's it's not it, you get a lot of surprises in the in, in that field, uh, and uh, uh, the surprises in insurance are never symmetrical. They're all bad. <laughs> Zone four. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Jin Ting Wang. I'm uh, from New Mexico, and uh, I'm a shareholder. I have two questions. First, that uh, in your 91 letter, uh, you wrote that uh, investors eventually repeat their mistakes. So uh, what do you do to keep you from making the same mistake twice? Now, and the second question is, in your 92 letter, uh, you wrote that you attempt to deal with the problem of uh, future earning uh, in two ways. Uh, first is the business you understand. And the second is the margin of safety. And uh, you said uh, uh, they are equally important. Uh, but, if you cannot, uh, but if you cannot find the happy combination of uh, faster growth at a low PE, uh, which one do you think is, is more important, uh, faster growth or low PE? That's my two questions. Right. I think we were, told by, we were told by some higher authority which one was more important there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're, they're, they're bound together. I, obviously, if you understood a business perfectly, uh, the future of a business, you would need very little in the way of a margin of safety. So the, the more volatile the business is, or possibility is, but assuming you still want to invest in it, the larger the margin of safety. I think in that first edition of Graham and Dodd, if I remember, it was a J.I. case he used and said, you know, maybe it was worth somewhere between 30 and 110 or some number. 
He said, well, that, you know, that sounds pretty, how much good does that do you to know that it's worth between 30 and 110? Well, it does you some good if it's selling below 30 or above 110. And that's, you need a large margin of safety. Uh, well, if you're, if you're driving a truck across a bridge that holds, it says it holds 10,000 pounds and you've got a 9,800 pound vehicle, you know, if the bridge is about six inches above the, 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 uh, uh, the crevice that it covers, you may feel okay, but if, it, if it's, you know, over the Grand Canyon, you may feel you want a little larger margin of safety in terms of only driving a 4,000 pound truck or something across. So it depends on the nature of the underlying risk. Uh, uh, we don't get the margin of safety now that, that, that we got uh, in a 1973 four period, for example. Uh, biggest thing to do is understand the business. If you understand the business uh, and get into the kind of businesses where surprises, by the nature of surprises, are few. And, and we think we're largely in that type of business. The earlier part about, you know, I, I've said about learning from your mistakes, the best thing to do is learn from other guys' mistakes. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, Patton used to say, you know, it's an honor to die for your country. Make sure the other guy gets the honor, you know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So our approach is, is, is really to try and learn vicariously, but there's a lot of mistakes that I've repeated. I can, I can tell you that. At, uh, uh, the biggest one, probably the biggest category over time, is being reluctant to pay up a little for a, really, for a business I knew was really outstanding or to continue to buy it at higher prices when I knew it was outstanding. So, the costs of that have been in, in many, many billions, uh, and and I'll probably keep making that mistake. Uh, uh, there are the mistakes are made when there are businesses you can understand and they're attractive, and you don't do something about it. I don't worry at all about the mistakes that come about because when I met Bill Gates, I didn't buy Microsoft or something. That's that's not my game. But the mistakes are made when you. Most of our mistakes have been mistakes of omission rather than commission. Charlie? Yeah, I think most people get very few what I call no-brainer opportunities, where it's just so damned obvious that, that this is going to work. And since they are very few and they may be separated by periods of years, I think people have to learn to have the, the courage and the intelligence to step up in a major way when those rare opportunities come by. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta be willing to take a really big bite. And uh, it's, it's crazy if you don't. And it's crazy if you dabble around at the edges so you're not prepared to take a big bite when the time comes. Uh, we apparently have lost mic four, so we're, gonna, we're just gonna use three mics from now on. And if, if you'll just make your way to those mics, uh, we'll see how we do with them. How about uh, zone one? Mr. Buffett, uh, my name is Pete Brown from Columbus, Ohio, uh, Class B shareholder. I had a couple questions, if I could. Um, the first is, um, I, I don't have a very good idea in my mind how our typical insurance operations work. I mean, in particular, how money leaves the insurance pool and enters the investment pool, and how our operations are different than the typical run-of-the-mill insurance operation you know, around the country. Why are we able to generate so much more float than than you know the XYZ company you know somewhere else, and the second question is um, it, it kind of goes back to an article you wrote for Fortune magazine back in the late 70s um, about the effect of inflation on on uh, equity values and, and that sort of thing. And in it, you asserted that uh, stocks were and businesses were really like bonds; um, they just had their own par, and the par being the average 12% return on equity that companies have averaged. Um, you know, a company that does better than that has assets that are worth way more than 100 cents on a dollar. A company does less, you know, will be less correspondingly. Um, my question is, when you're projecting cash flows of a company uh, as a prospective investment, why would you use the uh, going insur or interest rate, um, you know, of, of, of risk-free uh, treasury bills? Why wouldn't you use the sort of opportunity cost to discount it that maybe Charlie was referring to, maybe 12% return on equity of average corporations, maybe 
you know, your 15% goal, maybe Coca-Cola's return on equity is a comparison. I mean, doing that would dramatically change the value of the company that you're, that you're you know, evaluating, as I'm sure you know. Why would you use the risk-free rate is my question. The risk-free rate is used merely to equate one item to another. In other words, we're looking for whatever is the most attractive. But in, in terms of present valuing anything, we've got to, we, we're going to use a number. And, and obviously, we can always buy the government bond. So that, that becomes the yardstick rate. It doesn't mean we want to buy government bonds. It doesn't mean we want to buy government bonds if the best thing we can find is only has a present value that uh, works out at a half percent a year better than the government bond. But it, it's the appropriate yardstick, in our view, to simply use to compare across all kinds of investment opportunities, oil wells, farms, whatever it may be. Uh, now, it gets into degree of certainty, too, but, that, but it, it is, it, it's the yardstick rate. It's not, it's not because we want to buy government, government bonds, but it does, it does serve to make that a constant throughout the valuation process. Yep. Uh, in our insurance business, we really have a group of insurance businesses, and, and they have different characteristics. Uh, the consistent characteristic, actually, is that they're all very, very good businesses. Some of them are a lot larger and have opportunities to get larger, and some of them are not so large and, and have limited opportunities in terms of growth. But every insurance operation we have is a distinct asset to Berkshire. Uh, we've got smaller uh, workers' comp operation. We've got, we've got a, a, a credit uh, operation, credit card operation. We've got a home state operation. We have all these different businesses, Kansas bankers, sureties, whatever. They're all good businesses. Some of them do, don't develop a lot of float relative to uh, uh, premium volume. Uh, uh, the nature of Kansas bank or surety is that it won't develop a lot of float. It just happens to be the kind of business they write. The nature of comp is that it develops more float because comp claims pay more slowly. Uh, we, you really should think of each one of those having different characteristics. Geico is, is entirely different than the super cat business. They're both good businesses. In terms of how we invest the money when it comes in, we invest it when it comes in. I mean, it, it is, it, we'll get a large super cat premium today, it's invested. Now, if we have a claim tomorrow, then we disinvest, you know, and, and in a substantial way. If you take something like Geico, the cash flow is always going to be positive probably on that. You know, it, we won't have another Hurricane Andrew because we've backed out of the homeowner's business to quite an extent. So month by month, the money comes in at a GEICO, and the faster it grows, the more the money that comes in. We have so much capital that we can basically put that money into whatever makes the most sense for Berkshire. So we have none of the, either the mental or psychological constraints or the uh, or regulatory constraints that, 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 the, uh, that many insurance companies uh, operate under. They, many of them think they sort of should have this portion and this and this portion and that and so on. Investments usually play second fiddle to the insurance business at most companies that are in the insurance business. We look at them as being of equal importance, uh, and we run them as two distinct businesses. We do whatever makes most sense on the investment side, whatever makes the most sense on the insurance side. We never do anything on the investment side that will impinge on our business on the in insurance side. But you really should look at each one of our businesses separately. Geico has entirely different characteristics than the Supercat business. They both call themselves insurance. They both develop float. But in economic terms and in terms of competitive strengths and that sort of thing, they're two, two very different businesses. And our smaller businesses are different businesses. Some of those may grow reasonably well. We'll, we'll keep working on it. Charlie? Yeah. that, that if you you look at a corporate stock, it's obvious you can buy any maturity of government bond you want. So one opportunity cost of buying the stock is to compare it with the bond. Well, you may find that half the stocks in America you're so fearful about or know so little about or think so poorly of that you, you'd rather have the government bond. So on an opportunity cost basis, they're taken out of the filter. Now you start finding corporations where you like the stocks way better than, than government bonds. You've got to compare them one against the other. And when you find one that you regard as the best opportunity, 
that you can understand as the best opportunity, now you've got one to buy. It's a very simple idea, and it, it, it uses nothing but the most elementary ideas from, from, uh, from economics or game theory. It's, it's just, it's, it, it's child's play as a mental process. Now, it's hard to make the business appraisals, but the mental process is essential. If Charlie and I were forced, told we had a choice of buying stock A, B, C, or D, and all 2,500 or 3,000 or whatever may be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, or buying a 10-year government bond and we had to hold the stock for 10 years or the bond for 10 years, probably in at least 80 percent of the cases we'd, we'd take the 10-year government. You know, in many cases because we didn't understand the business well enough elsewhere. Or secondly, we may understand it and still prefer the 10 percent government. So, but we would measure everything that way. And, and uh, I don't know, what, did you come up with 80 percent or where, Charlie? Desert Island, 10 years? Get to fondle a stock certificate or fondle a government bond? Which one are you going to choose? <laughs> But anyway, I think life is a whole series of opportunity costs. Uh, you know, you got to marry the best person who is convenient to find who'll have you. You know, it's, <laughs> it, 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 investment is much the same sort of a process. I knew we'd get in trouble after lunch. <laughs> Zone two. <laughs> Hello, uh, Martin Wiegand, Bethesda, Maryland, stockholder. Uh, for myself, my family, and other small business owners, uh, I want to thank you for the annual reports. They help a lot in uh, helping us make business decisions and life decisions. My question is, many people come here, many, many people come here to listen to you and to, co and to copy and understand your investment philosophy. But why don't more people, in your opinion, try to copy your investment vehicle, a corporation that pays no dividends? Well, I don't really think if there were, I, I think there are other things that are probably better to copy about Berkshire, but they don't get copied either. It was always interesting to me how few people, everybody read Graham's, and they, they didn't really disagree with him. They just didn't like following him because it didn't, it didn't promise enough in a, in a sense. I mean, people, people really wanted something very quickly. In terms of not paying dividends, we don't pay dividends because we think we can turn every dollar we retain into more than a dollar of market value. I mean, the only reason for us to keep your money is if it becomes worth more by us keeping it than it would be worth if we gave it to you. And if we can create more than a dollar of market value for every dollar we keep, uh, you're better off whether you want to take that dollar out by selling a little piece of your stock or whether you continue to leave it in. That's the test. If we come to the conclusion that we can't do that, and we could come to the conclusion sometime, then we should distribute it to you. The interesting thing is we're in certain businesses, for example, Seize Candy being one, we don't have a way to intelligently use all of the money that C's generates within the C's candy company. So if C's were a standalone company, it would pay very large dividends. Not because it you know, just had some dividend pol paying policy, it would be simply because we wouldn't have a way of using, in this case, $30 million a year intelligently in expanding that business. The Buffalo News is the same way. We, we don't have a way of using money within that specific business intelligently to use the, the, the money that it generates. We hope that in the overall Berkshire Hathaway scheme of things that we can intelligently use the money that the companies in aggregate uh, uh, generate for us. And we think so far we have, and we think the prospects are reasonably good that we can continue to do that. But Dividend policy should really be determined by that criteria, also bearing in mind the possibilities of repurchase of stock, too, but they should be determined by whether a dollar left in the business is worth more than uh, to the shareholder than a dollar paid out. Someplace like Coca-Cola, you know, it, if Coca-Cola had paid no dividends and simply repurchased shares and developed the bottling system and done the things that they have, the shareholders probably would have been even better off They've been sensationally well off as it is, but they probably would have been even better off 
uh, than they have been uh, with, with the dividend policy they have had. And that's true for Gillette and Disney and, and companies of that sort that have got these terrific opportunities to use capital uh, within the business or to repurchase shares of a company that simply can't be replaced. If, if That usually is the best use of capital. It's probably better than dividends. And, uh, you know, we have written some about that, uh, Martin, but it, uh, people usually keep doing what they've been doing. It, uh, it's, it's, they're hard to change. Charlie? Well, it's interesting that you take that simple standard. You should retain money if you if you can make it worth more uh, than it is by retaining it. That is not the standard thing that's taught in the corporate finance departments of our major universities. Uh, why do we have this simple idea and they have another one? Time after time we find that so. Uh, I, I've tried to understand why they think the way they do and I have great difficulty with it. I've just concluded that they're wrong, and, but, but, that, but that isn't enough. There has to be a reason why so many smart people are that wrong, and uh, uh, that's a story for another day, but, but there are things gravely wrong with, with uh, American education that I hope that Berkshire Hathaway is slowly helping to fix. Can you imagine if the, you know, pick any one of you here, and let's say the two of us were in a business together, you know, it was earning $100,000 a year. You know, how would we decide whether to leave the 100000 each year? And we, it'd be exactly what we've talked about here. If we thought the 100000 would translate into a present value of more than 100000 by some action, we'd leave it in, and if it didn't, we'd take it out. You know, and uh, it doesn't seem to register generally. Uh, and incidentally, in our own case, we'll probably go too long uh, before we come to the conclusion that we're not really using it that effectively because there'll be a certain denial we'll go through and we'll say, well, that was just temporary last year. But, but <laughs> that, will, that is our approach and we'll, we'll do our best to apply it. Zone three. Uh, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger, my name is John Shane. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. You touched on the subject of uh, return on equity in response to a different question. I wonder whether you might be willing to elaborate along the following line. Uh, right now, the Standard & Poor 500 in aggregate have a return on equity of about 22 percent. Uh, the average over the decades for corporate America has been more like 12 or 13 percent. How did we get to this point of uh, extraordinary profitability? And uh, how likely do you think we are over the next 10 or 15 years to revert back to the mean of the low teens? Well, I, I would say this. I never thought it would happen. So I, I start out with the fact that if you'd listened to me, you'd have been dead wrong if, uh, uh, in terms of what the return on equity in 1996 or 1995, 1997 would be. Uh, it does not seem to me that that 22 percent returns on equity are sustainable in a, a world where the long-term interest rate is 7 percent and uh, where the capability of saving large amounts in the economy, uh, you know, are quite dramatic. Uh, you would just think that there would be some sort of leveling effect between 7 and the 22 you name that as savings got directed within the economy, and as the competitive forces operate that, that, that uh, we've been taught uh, will operate over time uh, would come into play. But, you know, I've been wrong uh, on that subject, and uh, that's why I say these levels are not unjustified if those kinds of returns can be made, because let's just say that you had a 22 percent perpetual bond, and you had the ability, and let's say that a quarter of that, a third of that coupon would be paid out. So you got a bond with a 22 percent coupon and say 7 percent is paid out, being the dividend payout on the S&P, we'll say, and the other 15 percent is reinvested in more 22 percent bonds with similar characteristics. Now what's that instrument worth on a present value basis in a 7 percent world? It's worth a lot of money. In fact, it's worth so much money that it becomes 
a mathematical fallacy at some point uh, because uh, when the compound rate becomes higher than the discount rate, you get into inf infinite uh, numbers, which are, or you get into infinity. Which, and, and that's a number, that's, that's a concept we like to think about around Berkshire, but we haven't figured out how to attain it. The, uh, there's a book called The Petersburg Paradox, or there's an article called uh, uh, The Petersburg Paradox and the Growth Stock Fallacy. <clears throat> I think that's the name of it by a fellow named, I think, David Duran written about 25 years ago, and it gets into this bit where the growth rate is higher than the discount rate, and it shouldn't work for an extended period of time, but uh, uh, it's sure fun while it's going on. Charlie? Yeah, I think a couple of things contributed to this phenomenon that we so carefully mispredicted. Uh, number one, it became very fashionable for corporations to buy-in shares, and I think that we helped in a very small way uh, bring on that enlightenment, and I think that was a plus in terms of rational corporate decision-making. The other thing that happened is that the antitrust administration got way more lenient in allowing people to buy competitors, and, uh, and I think those two factors helped raise returns on capital in the United States. And, uh, but that can't, uh, uh, you wouldn't think that could go on forever. And, and what 15% what per annum compounded will do is, is grow way faster than the economy can grow way faster than aggregate profits can grow over a long pull. So sooner or later something has to happen. I don't think we've reached a, a new order of things where uh, the laws of mathematics are somehow repealed. If real output in this country grows at, say, 3 percent a year, call it real GDP grows at 3 percent a year, and the capitalized value of industry in the country grows at 10 percent a year, at some point you get into mathematical absurdities. I mean, at the low inflation rates. It, 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 you know, you, you can't have a, if we have an economy that's seven or eight trillion now in GDP and seven or eight trillion in equity valuation, that may or may not make sense, but, but if you have one that's 15 billion in GDP and 75 billion in equity valuation, uh, 75 trillion in equity valuation, you know, you, you get to things that don't, can't make any sense. So if you get these differential rates of growth among items that have some relationship, however tenuous, or at least nonspecific in the in the short run, it, it doesn't work after a while. And you know nobody wants to think about that. They don't want to think about their own death. But I mean, it's it's it doesn't go away just because you don't want to think about it. And uh, uh, we haven't gotten any point like that. But but you can project out uh, numbers. Uh, and they just won't make any sense after a while. Yeah, corporate profits can't be 200% of GNP. Yeah. Indeed, they can't be 50% of GNP. So these, these high rates of compounding just go automatically into absurdity. Yeah, yeah they really can't be 20% of GDP or no, some number like no. that. So if, and if you start saying you can't have a multiple of more, you get, the, you get differential rates, and they, they just simply uh, you, you, you leave the tracks after a, after, after a while. And all you people should be aware of this because all the people who are professional sellers of investment advice and brokerage service, et cetera, et cetera, have an immense vested interest in believing that things that can't be true are true. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, they've been selected in a Darwinian process to have formidable sales skills and large energy. And, well, and this is dangerous to the rest of us. Yeah. Well, you've been selected to be the recipients of their advice. <laughs> right. Furthermore, they figure out who we are and, and uh, come in about 6 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> uh, zone 1 again. Mike Asale from New York City. Could you explain a little more about what you've called the mind of the consumer and the nature of the product and explain how you actually apply these concepts to find the companies with the, um, with the growing demand and the, the, the best uh, investment potential. And thank you for being two of the greatest professors I've ever had. <laughs> Thanks. 
The, uh, you know, what you really, when you get into consumer products, you're really interested in finding out or thinking about what is in the mind of how many people throughout the world about a product now and what it's likely to be in their mind five or 10 or 20 years from now. Now, virtually every person in the globe, maybe, well, let's get it down to 75% of the people in the globe, have some notion in their mind about Coca-Cola. You know, they have, the word Coca-Cola means something to them. You know, RC Cola doesn't mean anything to virtually anyone in the world. But, uh, you know, does what the guy owns RC, you know, <laughs> but, and the bottler, but, but it, it, but everybody has something in their mind about Coca-Cola. And overwhelmingly, it's favorable. It's associated with pleasant experiences. Now, part of that is that by design. I mean, it is where you are happy. It is at Disneyland, at Disney World, and it's at ballparks, and it's every place that you're likely to have a smile on your face including the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, I might add. And, and that position in the mind is pretty firmly established. And it's established in, in close to 200 countries around the world with people. A year from now, it will be established in more minds, and it will have a slightly, slightly, slightly different overall position. And 10 years from now, the position can move just a little bit more. It's, it's share of mind. It's not share of market. It's share of mind that counts. Disney, same way. Disney means something to billions of people. And if you're a parent with a couple of young children and you got 50 videos in front of you that you can buy, you're not going to sit down and preview an hour and a half of each video before deciding what one to stick in front of your kids. You know, you have got something in your mind about Disney and you don't have it about the ABC video company or you don't even have it about other, you don't have it about 20th century, you know, or you don't, you don't have it about Paramount. So that name to billions of people, including those, lots of people outside this country, it has a meaning. And that meaning overwhelmingly is favorable. It's reinforced by, by uh, the other activities of the company. And just think of what somebody would pay if they could actually buy that share of mind you know, of billions of people around the world. You can't do it. You can't, you can't do it by a billion dollar advertising budget or a three billion dollar advertising budget or hiring 20,000 super salesmen. So you've got that. Now, the question is, what does that stand for five or 10 or 20 years from now? You know there'll be more people. You know there'll be more people that have heard of Disney. And you know that there will always be parents that are interested in having something for their kids to do. And you know that kids will love the same sort of things. And you know that, 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 uh, huh? he, he emphasizes the key points when we get to those. The, um, but, but that is what you're trying to think about with the consumption product. That's what Charlie and I were thinking about when we bought C's Candy. I mean, here we were in 1972. You know, we, we think we know a fair amount about candy. I know more than when I sat down this morning. I mean, I had about 20 pieces already. But, you know, what, who's, you know, does their face light up on Valentine's Day, you know, when you hand them a box of candy and say, you know, it's some nondescript thing and say, here, honey, I took the low bid, you know, or something of the sort. And, no, I mean, you want something, you know, you've got, you've got tens of millions of people, or at least many millions of people, that, that remember that the first time they, they handed that box of candy, it wasn't that much thereafter that they got kissed for the first time or something. So it, it's, 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 the memories are good. The association's good. Total total process. It isn't just the candy. It's the person who, who uh, takes care of you at Christmas time when they've been on their feet for eight hours and people have been yelling at them because they've been in line with 50 people in line and that person still smiles at them. The delivery process, it's the shop in which they get all kinds of things. The treat we give them, it's all part of the marketing personality. But that, sh that position in the mind is what counts with a consumer product. And that means you have a good product, very good product. It means you may need tons of infrastructure because you've got to have that I had, I had a case of cherry coke awaiting me at the top of the Great Wall when I got there in China. Now that, you know, that, you've got to have something there so that the product is there when people want it. And uh, uh, that happened in World War II, uh, General Eisenhower, uh, you know, said to Mr. Woodruff that he wanted a, 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 a Coca-Cola with an arm's length of every American serviceman in the world, and they built a lot of bottling plants to take care of that. Um, that sort of, positioning 
can be incredible. It seems to work especially well for American products. I mean, people want certain types of American products worldwide. They're, you know, our music, our movies, our soft drinks, our fast food. You can't imagine, a, at least I can't, a French firm or a German for, firm or a Japanese firm having that s selling 47 or 48 percent of the world's soft drinks. I mean, it just doesn't, it, do, it doesn't happen that way. It's, it's part of something you could broadly call an American culture and, and the world hungers for it. And uh, Kodak, for example, probably does not have quite the same, and George Fisher's doing a great job with the company, this goes back before that, but Kodak probably does not have the same place in people's mind worldwide quite as it had 20 years ago. I mean, people, people didn't think of Fuji in those days, we'll say, as being in quite the same place. And then Fuji took the Olympics, as I remember, in Los Angeles, and they, they just, they put them, they pushed them their, their way to more of a parody with, it, with the Kodak, and you don't want to ever let them do that. And that's why you can see a Coca-Cola or a Disney or companies like that doing things that you think, well, this doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. You know, if they if you didn't spend this $10 million, wouldn't they still sell as much Coca-Cola? But, you know, that, I, I quoted from that 1896 report of Coca-Cola and the promotion they were doing back then, the, the spread the word. You never know which dollar is doing it, but you do know that everybody in the world that's virtually has heard of your product overwhelmingly they've got a favorable impression on them and the next generation is going to get it so that's that's what you're doing with consumer products with C's candy you know we are no better we, we want to no better than the last person who's been served their candy with the last product they've been served but as long as we do the job on that people can't catch us you know we can we can we can charge a little more for it because people are not interested in taking uh, the low bid and they're not interested in saving a penny a bottle on on uh, colas. They remember we talked about in these meetings private labels in the past. And private label is stalled out in the soft drink business that uh, they want the real thing. And uh, uh, 900 and some odd million eight ounce servings will be served today of Coca-Cola product around the world. 900 million, you know, and it'll go up next year, the year after. And I don't know how you displace companies like that. I mean, if you gave me $100 billion, and I encourage any of you who are thinking about that to step forward, but if, if, you, if you gave, <clears throat> and you told me to, to displace the Coca-Cola company as the leader in the world in soft drinks, you know, I, I wouldn't have the faintest idea how to do it. But, uh, and uh, those are the kind of businesses we like. Charlie? Yeah. I think the C's candy example has an interesting teaching lesson for all of us. Lauren said we were, it's the first time we really stepped up for brand quality, and it was a very hard jump for us who had been used to buying dollar bills for 50 cents. And uh, the interesting thing was that if they had demanded an extra $100,000, for the Seas Candy Company, we wouldn't have bought it. And that was after Warren had been trained under the greatest professor of his era and had worked 90 hours a week. And eaten a lot of chocolates, too. <laughs> yeah, absorbing everything in the world. I mean, we just didn't have minds well enough trained to make an easy decision right. And by accident, they didn't ask the extra $100,000 for it, and we, and we did buy it. And as it succeeded, we, we kept learning. I think that shows that the name of the game is, is, is continuing to learn. And even if you're very well trained and have some natural aptitude, you still need to keep learning. And that brings along the delicate problem. People sometimes talk about two aging executives. <laughs> I don't know what the hell that means as an adjective, because I don't know anybody that is going in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you people who hold shares are betting for a while at least until younger successors come along. You're, you're betting to some extent on what we'll now tactfully continue to call aging executives continuing to learn. Yeah, when we, if we hadn't bought C's, 
with some subsequent developments after that, because that made us aware of other things, we wouldn't have bought Coca-Cola in 1988. I mean, you can you can give C's a significant part of the credit uh, for the, I guess, $11 billion plus profit we've got in Coca-Cola at the present time. That, uh, now you say, well, how could you be so dumb as not to be able to recognize a Coca-Cola? Well. I don't know, but I... You're I, only I, drinking about 20 uh, cans Yeah, day, right. It know? wasn't I hadn't been exposed to it. Or, <laughs> and and I, it, it's amazing. But it uh, it just made us start thinking more. We, I mean, we saw how decisions we made in relation to seas played out in a marketplace and that sort of thing. And, and we saw what worked and didn't work. And uh, it made us appreciate a lot what did work and, 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 and shy away from things that didn't work. But it, 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 led, it definitely led to a to a Coca-Cola, and uh, we've had that, we've had the good luck to be, to buy some businesses themselves in, t in their entirety that taught us a lot. You know, we, we bought, we, and, and this worked in the other direction. I mean, we were in the uh, windmill business one time. I was, Charlie was, was, stayed out of the windmill business, but I was in the windmill business and pumps and, and uh, uh, Third level department or second level department stores, and I just found out how tough it was, and how it didn't. You could apply all kinds of energy to them, and it did, it didn't do any good. It uh, it made a great deal of sense to figure out what pond to uh, jump in, uh, and what pond you jumped in was was probably a, more important than how well you could swim. Um, Charlie, I don't think it's necessary that people be as ignorant as we were as long as we were. <laughs> I think American education could be could be better, but not uh, not in the hands of many of the people who are now teaching it. <laughs> Is there any group we've forgotten to offend? I mean <laughs> Okay, zone two. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, my name is Hudson Zhu, and originally from China, and I'm living in Kansas. And it's my honor to speak to you both. My question is, if someone like to form a company doing what you did 30 or 40 years ago, what is your suggestion to them? And would you share some of your wisdom with us? Thank first, you. First thing we suggest, they send us a royalty. But <laughs> they, Charlie, uh, you uh, take over on that. Um, you've thought more about starting over again than I have. <laughs> I, I want to frankly say that that's a question I ordinarily duck. I always believe in getting the fundamental mental tools in place. And I always believe in, in running reality as it comes in, preferably vicariously through the newspaper etc. instead of through personal painful experience through the filter of these sound ideas and uh, I not only think that that works in life to create success I think it makes life more fun so uh, I argue for for sound thinking but the exact specific techniques of of uh, turning yourself into another Warren Buffett, uh, I leave to you. Hmm. Well, the one, the one thing I would advise is I, I would be, I, I, A, I think there's a ton of opportunity out there, and, and, uh, and the, uh, I would do something I, I enjoyed. I wouldn't do something because I thought it was going to get me to a life I was going to enjoy later on, or, or, or because if I made a lot of money, I was going to be a lot happier or anything like that. Uh, I've never done that, and, and I, I think that you will do well in what you enjoy, and I think it's crazy in life to endure a whole lot that, uh, I don't mean, Charlie and I worked in a grocery store, we didn't really jump up and down over it all the time, but, but in terms of it, making a commitment to, uh, to really be in a business that only, you're only in it for the money, I think that's crazy. It, uh, uh, if, if we were in this for only for the money, you know, we'd, we'd have quit a long time ago, obviously. And, and it just, you, won't, you, you, you ought to have fun while you're doing it. It should not be jammed tomorrow and not jammed today. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And, and uh, uh, 
Uh, I think you'll get better results that way, too. Zone two? Or did we just do zone two? I think we did. Yeah, maybe zone three. I'm uh, Dave Uberg from Sac City, Iowa. And I must... I haven't heard you on the moral and ethical considerations of stocks like ABC and Disney. They are now getting more and more criticism from mainstream religious groups in this country. Main reliance on sex and violence and their cronyism, homosexuality and I didn't. I, 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 we, we didn't cut anybody off there. I, 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 the, uh, yeah, right. What? <laughs> the, uh, but I would, I would say that, you know, I, I, I'm delighted to uh, have my grandchildren exposed to the full range of Disney product. I'm, and, I, I, you know, I'd love to take them to Disneyland or Disney World or take them to Disney movies or Disney videos. So, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I think the, the, the Disney company is being run in an absolutely first-rate way, and uh, I have no problem whatsoever with, with uh, uh, gays being employed or receiving benefits or anything of the sort. Uh, zone one. Good afternoon, Mr. Buffett. Good afternoon, Mr. Munger. My name is Basuni Rima from Arlington, Texas. Uh, I uh, see in the uh, USA Today uh, article about the shortage of labor in the state. And I was wondering, when you analyze a company, do you take that into consideration by choosing companies who are not dependent so much on labor? Uh, the second question is, uh, I heard you in the beginning of the uh, meeting that is so much capital coming from foreign country you mentioned so many different country who buy who bought the uh, Brookshire Hathaway and I'm sure they buy all companies in the Dow do you feel like the the analyst who uh, analyzed the the Dow had that into consideration that the Dow now is becoming as the Walmart of the security business in the world, where all the national of different country, they buy bass, their, uh, their, uh, their market, and they come in and buy in the United States. And as a result, that uh, the idea of Mr. Greenspan, as far as exuberant, it's mute because uh, if you remember how the Japanese, when they start to buy the, uh, the real estate in America, they force us to pay high premium for the price, and I think that's what's going to happen in the market. And we, as Americans, who are being accustomed to low PEs, now we're going to miss on, uh, and, the, and this, the price is going to continue going up. And the third question is, Maybe, uh, maybe, 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 right. we better, maybe we better stop it, too. <laughs> uh, All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. The uh, second way, we, we pay very little attention, uh, we don't pay any attention to uh, capital flows. In other words, we don't really care who's buying or selling any security. Somebody is buying or selling e each one. So obviously, there's, you know, you could, you could focus on the buyers, you could focus on the sellers, but uh, you can say now that there's 20 billion in month or so going into equity funds and all but it doesn't make any difference to us we all we're interested in what the, is what the business is worth and what people are paying attention to in terms of capital flows or whatever or market signals or whether the fed's going to move that all changes you remember 10 years ago it was you know it was m2 that every everybody every whatever day of the week it was you know what what's m2 this week i always thought of having a mystery you know about whatever happened to m2 or so but it, there's always something that people are talking about. There's so much time to fill with chatter, you know, that, and, and pages to fill, that they, they, they write about all these things that 
to, to us don't make much difference because we don't care if the market closes for the next five years. We care how much Coca-Cola is sold five years from now and what percentage of the world market they have and what they're charging for it and how many shares are outstanding and that sort of thing. But we just we don't care who's buying or selling it in the least, except we like it when the company's buying it. Uh, the same way with, with Gillette, we care about whether people are trading up in the shaving experience. So capital flows and all of those macro factors that people like to write about a lot <clears throat> just have nothing to do with what we do. We're buying businesses. And uh, I really think it is not a bad mindset to, whenever you buy a stock to say, would I be happy buying this stock if the market closed for five years? Because then you're buying a business if you say yes to that. If you don't say yes to that, you may, you may not be focusing on, 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 on the proper thing. Uh, um, by its nature, the U.S. is running a substantial trade deficit, merchandise trade deficit. If, if, if you buy more from the rest of the world than you're selling them, which is what happens when you're running a trade deficit, you have to balance the books. I mean, they get something in exchange, and what happens is they get some sort of capital asset in exchange. They may get a government bond, they may get a piece of the U.S. business or something, but you, the, the key thing in economics, whenever somebody makes some assertion to you about economics, you always want to say, and then what? In fact, it's not a bad idea to say that about everything in life, but you always have to say, and then what? So when you read that the merchandise trade deficit is $9 billion, what else does that mean? Well, it means that somehow we have to have created $9 billion of capital assets, claims on our production in the future, with somebody else in the world. So they have to invest. They don't have any choice. When somebody says, won't it be terrible if the Japanese sell all their government bonds? They can't sell all the government bonds without getting something else in exchange. You know, they get some other American asset in exchange because they... There's no other way to do it. They can sell it to the French, but then the French have the same problem. So trace through where the transactions go anytime someone starts talking about one specific action in economics. Question about labor. Uh, generally speaking, obviously, we, we like a business with low labor costs, but we like a business with low costs of every kind, <laughs> because the rest is profit. Uh, so it would be true that on balance we would not be high on labor intensive companies but there's some business there's some very good businesses that that are labor intensive but if you say would i rather have a labor intensive business or a non labor intensive business and everything else is equal the answer is the less labor intensive business charlie you want to come in on either one No, I don't think I've got anything more. Area two. Uh, for, first, I'd like to thank you both for being so generous with your time and with your ideas for us today. Thank you. We get paid by the hour, so it. it <laughs> well, I'll try and talk quickly then. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> my name is uh, Bob Costa from Evansville, Indiana. I've been a shareholder for four years. Uh, this is my first visit to uh, Omaha, and I went to the Mega Mart, and I actually bought something there, and I tried to pay for it with an American Express card. Uh huh. And they told me, just like the, uh, just like the ad, you can't use it here. Uh, I'd, I'd hope you both comment on that, or at least one of you. Uh, but my real question is that I just stumbled across the idea of intellectual capital and, and how that might be useful in valuing a business, and I was hoping that uh, one or both of you could uh, clarify that for me and whether that's useful to us as investors or, or just another academic theory that we'd be better off ignoring. Yeah. Harvey Golub, who runs American Express and has done a terrific job of running it, has written me about the uh, about the furniture mart as well as about C's. Uh, and uh, we basically let our managers run their own businesses. So the people at each entity, Borsheim Stakes, American Express, uh, not, uh, others of our businesses do too. We, we let every manager make his decisions. As soon as I start telling the managers that they ought to say take American Express or not take Visa or whatever it may be, you know, at that point, They've lost some of the responsibility for their operations, and and the, and perhaps to an extent, even you know some of the pride that comes from running them. They, most of our managers do not need to work for a living. They they run their businesses for the same reason Charlie and I run Berkshire. They they, they love doing it. They jump out of bed in the morning because it's exciting to do. And the 
one thing that would keep the two of us or drive the two of us away from Berkshires if we were getting second guessed all the time or somebody else was telling us when to swing or not to swing. We would have no interest in running the business. We'd go run, we'd do something else then. And maybe our other managers aren't as extreme as we are in that respect, but we, we feel they've built successful businesses. They know how to do it. We do allocate the excess capital they generate, but aside from that, we, we really let them make their own decisions. So we have no company-wide policy uh, on virtually anything that I can think of except send money to Omaha. Uh, <laughs> but, and, you know, we're delighted to have American Express give the Furniture Mart the reasons why the Furniture Mart will be better off using American Express, and my guess is they have some very good reasons, and, but they're going to have to sell them on that, and just like uh, any vendor of anything has to sell each operation. We wouldn't, we wouldn't tell the people at Seas who to buy these, the, the nuts from, or who to buy the, uh, the container from, or uh, anything of the sort, how to design the stores, or whatever it may be. And, and that's, just, that's just the Berkshire uh, philosophy on, on, on that. Charlie, you want to come in? Yeah. Uh, let me shift to intellectual capital. Berkshire has a lot of intellectual capital in these very able executives in the various businesses, and we hope we've got some intellectual capital in the few hundred square feet at headquarters. But <laughs> we are not in the business of designing oil refineries with armies of engineers or developing software with armies uh, uh, doing complicated uh, accounting work all over the world. Uh, we, we just haven't drifted into that kind of a, of, of a business. And intellectual capital has gotten to be a new buzzword because we've now developed huge businesses like Microsoft, which really didn't exist on that scale not so very long ago. And so people have suddenly realized, my God, there's really a lot of money in and aggregation effects and momentum effects when you get a bunch of really bright people working in the same direction. And that's what's, that's what's made the concept so fashionable. By and large, we've avoided the field. Again, it's hard for us to understand. Yeah, we, we've looked for brains and energy and integrity in people that we work with. And if you get that combination and you're in a decent business, you know, you're going to own the world. And you know, whether you call it intellectual capital or anything, you know, you, you can, you can stick, stick the names on it. And that's who, who we try to associate with. I mean, it's a lot easier than doing it yourself. And when we get in our own businesses, you saw that group there at the end of the movie. I mean, that's a huge asset to Berkshire. Uh, we, they talk about getting into accounting for it. That's nonsense in my view. I mean, you don't need to do that. But you, you, you should pay for it, and you should pay for it as shareholders. You should pay for it as managers. When we get people, you know, whether it's Tom Murphy or Al Zane at Gillette or Roberto Goizueta or Michael Eisner, I mean, those people have added billions of dollars of value. And uh, it's just, you know, that's who we want to be associated with. And we don't want to be associated with the mediocre managers because uh, uh, the, the difference is just is, is huge. But we don't go through a, an elaborate exercise. We just recognize the people that have got those. We think we. We try to recognize the people who've got those qualities, and then we, and then if they're in a good business and they've got those qualities, uh, we want to take a big bite. But take intellectual capital. People think patents. They think copyrights. Uh, patents and copyrights have gotten to be way more valuable as a percentage of the uh, investment assets of the world, and so people are very much more interested in intellectual capital. Think of the great drug companies and how small they were 20 years ago and how everything they have is basically intellectual capital. It's the few products that have, uh, that really work that have the patents. Uh, no, no, I, but by and large, we're not in drug companies. No, but that's a, there, are, there are different forms. Of, as Charlie said, there's, there's businesses you sort of think of that way as, as, as their whole being being intellectual capital, but I would argue that that when Roberto Goizueta 15 years ago saw how to make the future of Coke, same product, dramatic and 
basically the same system, although it required some changes, uh, but saw how to make that dramatically more valuable uh, by doing a lot of little things over a long period of time and doing them consistently and not getting his eye off the ball. Michael Eisner did the same thing. that Disney hadn't gone any place, you know, in the 15 years or so after Walt died. Now, you know, we all knew who Mickey Mouse was and everything, but Michael really saw what the future should be. And he still does. You know, and, and how, you can say it's easy when it's all over, but, but how many people were doing something about it at the time? The place was, was languishing, basically, uh, 15 years ago. They had the assets. Uh, and to me, that's, you know, it's different than what Bill Gates does or Andy Grove does, but it's, it's, it's our form of intellectual capital, and it's one we can understand better. Uh, zone, uh, what do we have? Three. Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. My name is Will Jacks. I'm from Chicago and I'm a happy shareholder. I first want to thank both of you for the unusual privilege you give us, your time and your expertise. This is very unusual and I think is, is to be commended. And my question has to do with of one of the major American industries that, unless I missed something in the reading, that is the pharmaceutical industry, the companies that make medicines. And I wonder under what circumstances you might consider uh, those industries for investment by Berkshire Hathaway. Well, those industries, the, the pharmaceutical industry has obviously been a terrific industry to invest in. We have trouble, or at least I have trouble, distinguishing among the companies in terms of seeing which ones 10 years from now might be the, the the best ones to be in. I mean, it's easier for me to figure out that Coca-Cola is the soft drink company to be in or Gillette is the shaving company to be in or Disney is the entertainment company to be in than it is for me to figure out which one in, in the pharmaceutical. But that I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm <clears throat> just saying that that's difficult for me. <clears throat> we have, we started buying one of them a couple of years ago, we should have, and we should have continued, but we didn't because it went up an eighth. And uh, <laughs> your chairman was a little reluctant to follow it. That terrible mistake. But uh, I would say the biggest, and we could have bought the whole industry and done very well at, at various times, particularly when the uh, the, th the threat of uh, uh, what people thought was the threat of the Clinton Health Program uh, cast a big cloud over the pharmaceutical industry. That was a time you could have just bought the whole industry and done very well. We didn't do it, it was a mistake. Uh, Charlie? Well, it's hard to think of any industry that's done more good for consumers generally. When you think of the way children used to die and now they very seldom die. And, and uh, it's been a fabulous business and it's been one of the glories of American uh, civilization. But it's, we've admired it, but we haven't been part of it. We've missed a lot of things, and I'm yeah. dead serious about that. And we've missed things that that should not have been beyond our capacity to uh, grasp. There's a lot of things that, be, that should be beyond our capacity to grasp, but but there's some that that, that haven't been, and, and we've just been plain missed them. Zone one. Uh, hello, I'm another Chicagoan, Shrikant Ranganekar, and a share owner. Uh, this question is di directed first to Mr. Uh, Munger and then to Mr. Buffett. Uh, Mr. Munger, I am intrigued by your marshalling of the Commodore and Aristotle to support your points. Uh, very few of today's money managers would or could do that. Um, could you elaborate on what role a study of history of civilization plays in developing a sound investment philosophy? Thanks. Well, I, I don't want to praise Aristotle too much. You know, he was the one who thought that women had a different number of teeth from men and <laughs> never looked in his wife's mouth. <laughs> Maybe his wife did. <laughs> I, I'm all in favor of a good general education, and I think it helps investment performance and it helps business performance, and it helps one 
be a better citizen and and some of the things people say are quite memorable and therefore they're helpful to the mind by the very ease with which they're remembered and i think you'd be surprised how many bright investment professionals could talk a lot about aristotle or even people i can't stand like <laughs> hegel <laughs> You want to quote a little more from anybody no, here? No. <laughs> Reinforce your. Yeah. Oh, my! One of my favorite quotations in the whole world is from Einstein. He says, "Everything should be made as simple as possible, but no more simple." And uh, I think that describes the reality that we all face. <laughs> Charlie's favorite, though, is Ben Franklin. At uh, that's probably true, isn't it, Charlie? Yeah. We get more from Ben than than anybody else. Keep thy shop, and it will keep thee. That sort of thing. I mean, we're yes. just we're loaded with that stuff. <laughs> Three removes are as good as a fire. <laughs> it's hard for an empty sack to stand upright. <laughs> That's the Bible around Berkshire. Yeah. I once heard Warren say, "The reason I'm so financially conservative is I, I don't want to find out how badly I might behave if I were stretched." <laughs> I think we better cut him off here. Uh, <laughs> zone two, you better uh, yeah. cut the thumping there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My name is uh, Stanley Watkins and uh, from Manhattan, Kansas, and I'm a shareholder. And uh, I have two questions. And the first one, I, I know the answer, so you can just say yes or no. <laughs> Uh, would you consider investing in indexes such as OEX, pure speculation? Um, uh, you're going to say yes. And number two, uh, would you encourage investors to, uh, if they were trying to get uh, a lot of their investment, to use leaps on investments such as Coca-Cola instead of buying the stock? Use what on? Uh, I missed that. Leaps. Leak? Leaps, L -A -A -P -S. Oh, yeah. oh, I see. We're still on options. Oh, yeah. Well, the, yeah, both the questions relate to to futures of one sort, uh, calls or whatever they may be. And, and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, investors should stick to buying ownership in businesses. I, uh, it's not that you can't come up with a theoretical argument for buying, say, a, I mean, if you think Coca-Cola is attractive, you can say, well, I'd rather buy a five-year option on, on Coke than buy the stock directly because it in introduces leverage without the risk of going broke. But uh, I think that that's a dangerous path to start down because it, uh, it, if it works well, it, it's, so, it, it, it's, it's dynamite to start playing with things that can expire and become worthless or or can be bought with very low margin, as the as the uh, OEX options you were talking about. Uh, borrowed money usually or frequently leads to trouble, and it's not necessary. I mean, it it, it uh, you know if if you had some compelling reason, if you're gonna ha if you had to double your money by the end of the year and be shot, you know, then I would head for the futures market because you you know you you need to do it. I mean, you have to you have to introduce borrowed money, but but. Uh, you really ought to figure out how you can be happy with the present amount of money you've got, and then figure that everything else is, you know, all to the good as you go along. And and uh, uh, I, I don't I don't think people, once they start focusing on short-term price behavior, which is the nature of buying buying uh, calls or, or leaps or or uh, speculating in index futures, once you start concentrating on that. I think you t you're very likely to take your eye off the main ball, which is just valuing businesses. So I, I don't recommend it. Charlie? Well, this is a group of affluent investors, and I don't think many of them did it in leaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's certainly true. If we'd, if we'd operated Berkshire with considerable borrowed money over the years, you know, it it would have done very much better than it has, but but nobody knew what that amount of borrowed money would have, the appropriate level would have been. And 
it wouldn't have made any difference to us. I mean, we have just as much fun uh, doing what we've done than if we'd, if we'd owned it on leverage and, and it had been twice as much. I mean, it, it just, it's just not, it's not the way we approach it. Uh, if you have X and you think you're going to be way happier when you've got two X, it, it, it's probably not true. It, it, uh, it's, uh, you really ought to enjoy where you are at the point, and if you can make, you know, if you can make 12 or 15 percent a year and you desire to save and you like piling it up, you know, it'll all come in time, and, and why, uh, you know, why risk losing what you need, you know, in half for what you don't need and don't have it? It's never made a lot of sense to us. Warren wrote a letter when they were developing the security options businesses, and he urged the civilization not to allow the new exchanges. And uh, you can see how much attention they paid to him. <laughs> yeah, the usual amount. <laughs> Area three. Hi, my name is Greg Kolarch, a uh, shareholder from Calgary, Canada, the home of Briax Minerals. Um, my, question, <laughs> my, my question for you is, uh, the companies in the hazardous waste disposal industry have underperformed the market for about a decade now. Do you see any value in that area? Uh, we've never looked at that business. At, um, I mean, I'm familiar with the names of the companies, and, but that's, that's been a business that uh, I've never looked at. And uh, maybe Charlie knows more about it than I do. He almost no, asked no, to. No, no. <laughs> no, we have never really looked at the hazardous waste business. Uh, we think there's a lot of toxic waste in the securities market. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we get our fill that way. <laughs> Area one. <laughs> Uh, my name is Hugh Stevenson. I'm a shareholder from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my question involves GEICO. If I remember correctly from last year, GEICO uh, had about 2% of the insurance market and had approximately $4 billion in float. Uh, my question is, as their market share expands, will their float in your expectation expand in a somewhat linear fashion? Uh, and related to that, uh, what is your guess might be the top end? Could they ultimately become as dominant as a Gillette or a Coke in their businesses, or is the nature of it such that um, you know they might stop at 10 percent of the market or 15 percent when they start to hit a significant hurdle? Um, and, and second, to follow up on this other gentleman's question, if you don't adjust for risk by using higher discount rates, uh, how do you adjust for risk, or do you? Well. The second question, we, we adjust by simply trying to buy it at a, a big discount from that present value calculated using the, the risk-free interest rate. So uh, if interest rates are 7 percent and we discounted back the flows, which Charlie says I never do anyway, we, and he's correct, but if, if in, in theory if we discount them back at 7 percent, then we would, we would look at a substantial discount from that present value number in order to uh, warrant buying. Question about GEICO, the float will grow more or less proportionately to premium volume. There's a moderate amount of our float, a very small amount of the float that's accounted for by some discontinued lines from the past, and of course that won't grow the same way. But if we double the size of GEICO on premium volume, we'll come close to doubling the size of the float. The, uh, you know, the history of auto insurance is quite interesting. It's something that isn't studied at business schools and should be studied because the great insurance companies of the early 1900s were, uh, you know, whether it's Aetna, Hartford, Travelers, they had these agency forces nationwide and wrote uh, what was then more property business. They wrote a lot of fire business in those days, and of course the automobile only came in, uh, you know, in, in the early 1900s. And so th their orientation was to property business, but they had this huge agency force throughout the United States. There were, there were property uh, insurance agents representing these big companies in every, throughout the country. And they had lots of capital. And now if you look at the business in 1997, 
something well over 20 percent, probably 20, close to 25 percent of the personal auto and homeowners business and insurance is written, uh, is written by a company called State Farm. And State Farm was started, I believe, in the 20s by a fellow in Bloomington, Illinois, <clears throat> with no capital to speak of, no agency force initially, and started as a mutual company. No incentive. I mean, no stock options, no, no uh, capital invested where he could become a billionaire if he built the business up or anything. So here this company starts without any of the capitalist incentives that we are taught are essential to a business growing, and in a huge industry becomes the dominant player. It has more than twice the market share of Allstate, the second player, becomes the dominant company against these extremely entrenched competitors with great distribution systems and loads of capital. Now I say that's, and incidentally State Farm on the Fortune 500 list of companies has the third largest net worth of any company in the United States. Number three from Bloomington, Illinois with a guy with no money in it. Now how does that happen? Well I would say that's a subject we're studying, you know, for in, 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 in business schools because it you know, Darwin used to say that any time he got any evidence that, that flew in the face of his previous convictions, he had to write it down in the first 30 minutes, or the mind was such that it would reject contrary evidence to, to cherished beliefs. And uh, certainly there's some cherished beliefs around business schools that, uh, that might uh, uh, at least find some interesting aspects in studying how a company could become third largest company in net worth in the country with no apparent advantage going in. There's another company down in Texas called USAA, United States, it's for the it, uh, United Services Auto Association, and it's, uh, it, it's been enormously successful, has billions of net worth, uh, loads of satisfied policyholders, the highest renewal ratio among policyholders in the country. Nobody studies that, to my knowledge, either. The people who started GEICO came from that company in 1936, Leo Goodwin and his wife, who had worked for USAA, went over and started this little GEICO company with practically no capital. And now it's, uh, we have about 2.7% of the market and we're, we'll write uh, probably three and a half billion of voluntary auto this year. Catching a state farm it's going to be very difficult, so I wouldn't want to predict we do that. I will predict that we will gain very materially in market share over the next 10 years, and uh, we'll gain materially this year. But we will, we will, we will, we have got a, we have got a very good mousetrap. I said in the report that 40 percent of you would save money insuring with that. I didn't say 100 percent or 80 percent or 60 percent because uh, there are areas and professions where somebody else is going to have a lower price than we are. But if across the country, we, we are going, and for all classes of citizens, we are going to have a low price, the low price more often than anyone else. And we've got that because we've got low costs, and our costs are gonna get lower, and it, we've got a virtuous circle going in, in terms of it feeding on itself. So GEICO will, will grow a lot, but I, State Farm is, is plenty tough, so I'm, I'm not gonna predict catching State Farm. <clears throat> I'm not even going to predict catching Allstate, but we'll catch somebody. And uh, Charlie, you want to say anything more? <coughs> well, I love your example of State Farm. I mean, the idea of picking some extreme example and asking my favorite question, which is, what in hell is going on here? <laughs> it, it, that is the, the way to wisdom in this world. And uh, it is too bad. A lot of the mutual companies are now trying to demutualize, helped by a bunch of consultants and so forth. And uh, they are not looking at State Farm, they're looking at some other model. And uh, everybody can't be a State Farm. That place got some fundamental values into its uh, operating mechanics, uh, the way it selected personnel, the way it selected agents, the way it discarded agents. Uh, it was huge discipline, wouldn't you agree, in that operation? Yeah, well, yeah somebody, you, you would say somebody had to do something very right. But the question, I don't know anybody studying what they did that was right. You know, they, uh, they don't want to because it, 
what, it doesn't fit the pattern. And, and uh, you know, when something like a State Farm happens in this world, you should, you, should try to get, you should try to understand it. When something like a GEICO happens in this world, you should try to understand it. In 1948, I think it was two-thirds or three-quarters, I think it was two-thirds of GEICO was for sale because a fellow that originally backed these two people from USAA died. And so state had the stock for sale in 1948. You couldn't sell it. That's how Ben Graham ended up buying it <clears throat> for Graham Newman because they hawked it all over for six months. They went to all the big insurance companies, and the insurance companies who could see this company on a very, very tiny scale offering a, a product for way less money and making lots of money doing it, they simply couldn't shake themselves loose from the mists of the past to, uh, to step up and buy it. They could have bought it for a million two hundred thousand dollars, as I remember, you know, and owned the whole company. Uh, and instead, they've watched their own distribution system get, get their heads beaten in you know, over the years. And uh, uh, all the time, you know, with these ideas from the past. So you have to be very careful to, uh, to uh, look hard at what's really happening. You know, as Yogi Berra said, you can, you can observe a lot just by looking. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, zone one. I'm Everett Puri from Atlanta, Georgia, and I wanted to ask you uh, if you could comment on the matter of intrinsic value as it applies to some of the inevitables, given the, that the overpayment risk now is high and uh, the share repurchases that uh, are going on there. Yeah, well, we won't, we won't stick a price on them. We, just, we, we, we tell you that they are absolutely wonderful businesses run by sensational people and that they are selling at prices that are higher than they've sold at most of the time. Uh, and then, th but that, you know, they may, be, they may well be worth it and worth a lot more even in terms of present terms or, or it may turn out they're a couple of years ahead of themselves. We don't know the answer to that. We know we're very happy, happy owning them. Uh, Gillette does not repurchase its shares or hasn't in any significant quantity for many years. Coke consistently repurchases its shares. Uh, we generally like the policy of companies that have really wonderful businesses repurchasing their shares. It's, it, uh, there aren't that many super businesses in the world, and the idea of owning more and more of a company like that over a period of time um, has, a, has an appeal to us and almost an appeal regardless of price. It, uh, uh, the problem is that most companies that repurchase their shares you know, are, are, so, so, are frequently so-so businesses, and they're being done for motivations other than in, intensifying the interests of the shareholders in a wonderful business. But where you really know you have a wonderful business, and we think most of the ones we own are anywhere from extremely good to wonderful, we think it usually makes a lot of sense. It, it, uh, it's hard to do things intelligent with, with money in this world, and, and uh, Coke has been very intelligent about using their capital to particularly to fortify and improve their bottler network around the world. I mean, they've done a terrific job that way. That was, that was a neglected area for a long time, and that comes first, but there's only so far you can go with that, and, and uh, to enhance the ownership of the shareholders in a company like Coca-Cola. When we bought our first Coca-Cola in 88, we bought about 6.2% of the company. And at that time, they may have, been, may have been 600 million servings, not any more than that a day. So we had an interest in 36 or 37 million servings. Now we have 8% of 900 million plus. So we have an interest in 75 million or so servings a day. 75 million people are drinking Berkshire Hathaway share of Coca-Cola products today in an eight ounce serving. You know, and the profit's gone up a little per serving, so that gets pretty attractive, and we, we just soon they uh, keep doing that. The bottling thing's actually kind of interesting, uh, and a fellow from Omaha, or at least lived in Omaha for a long time, Don Keogh, had a lot to do with this, all, and Roberto had plenty to do with it too, obviously, but the Candler, Asa Candler, back in the late 1880s, in a, a series of transactions, I think some of it's a little fuzzy exactly, as to the timing of them, but he, he essentially bought the whole Coca-Cola company for $2,000. And uh, uh, 
That may be the smartest purchase in the history of the world. And then in 1899, I believe it was, a couple of fellows from Chattanooga came down. And in those days, soft drinks were sold over the counter to people in, in drugstores primarily. But uh, there was a little bottling going on. There's already was somebody bottling in Mississippi, as I remember. But uh, a couple of fellows came down and they said, you know, bottling's got a future and you're busy on the, on the uh, uh, fountain side of the business, so why don't you let us develop the bottling system? And I guess Mr. Candler didn't think much of bottling, so he gave them a contract in perpetuity for almost all of the United States for a dollar he sold it to them and gave them the right to buy Coca-Cola syrup at a fixed price forever. So Aza, who had scored with his $2,000 in a rather big way, managed to uh, write what, uh, you know, it's easy for us to look back, at, but it certainly looks like one of the dumbest contracts in, in, in history. And of course, as the years went by, and particularly around World War II, when the price of syrup was the primary ingredient in terms of cost in syrup was sugar, and sugar went wild during and after World War I in price, and so here was a guy that in effect had contracted to sell sugar at a fixed price forever, and he'd also given these people perpetual rights and so on. In those days, they sold these sub-rights to bottler contracts, and those were usually the distance that a horse could go in a day and come back. That was sort of the circle that you gave people. And uh, the Coca-Cola company was faced over the years with the problem of having these, the bottling system, which soon became the dominant system for distribution of Coke, being subject to a contract where there was no price flexibility and where the contracts ran in perpetuity. And of course, every bottler on his deathbed would call his children and his grandchildren around and he'd prop himself up and croak out in his last breath, you know, don't let him screw with the bottling contract, you know, and then he'd croak. And, 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 so the Coca-Cola company faced this for decades, and they really couldn't do much about that bottling system for a long time. And, and, and Roberto and Don Keogh and some other people spent 20 or 25 years getting that rationalized. There were lawsuits back in the 20s and some things. But it, it was a huge, huge project, but it made an enormous difference over time in the value of the company. And that's what I mean when I talk about intellectual capital is because you know you aren't going to get results on that in a day or a week or a month or a year if you set out to, to get that all rationalized. But, but they decided that, that to get the job done, they had to do this. And that took capital, and they used capital to get that job done, but they used capital beyond that to repurchase shares in a big way. And it's been very smart, and I hope they, I, you know, I, they are repurchasing shares probably as we talk. And uh, that's, that, that's fine with me. Charlie? Uh, Well, I do think Coca-Cola Company is one of the most interesting cases in the history of business, and it ought to be way more studied than it is. And there, there's just lesson after lesson after lesson in the history of the Coca-Cola Company. And uh, but it's too long a story for today. <laughs> Section two. Jolene Crowley from San Diego, and I want to say I'm, I feel very lucky to be here today as when I tried to buy my first baby Berkshire share last year, my stockbroker, who's a value investing devotee, tried to talk me out of it, telling me that it was overvalued. So I feel lucky to be here. I've recently also discovered West Coast stock and I'd like you to explain to me the ownership and management relationships between Berkshire, Hasco, be, between Berkshire Hathaway and Wesco and how you use them together. And since I may not understand the answer to that question, <laughs> could you just tell me, is it possible that buying Wesco today at about $20 a share is like buying Berkshire Hathaway was 20 years ago? 
Well, if you could buy Wesco today at twenty dollars a share, you should buy all you can. <laughs> no, no, your pardon. Uh, two hundred dollars a share. Two hundred. Yeah, yeah oh, Char Charlie yeah. is uh, Charlie is chairman of Wesco, and uh, why don't you talk about it first, Charlie? Wesco is eighty percent owned by Berkshire, and in terms of operating businesses now, it's 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 got two, and uh, and it has an immense percentage of its net worth in marketable securities in its insurance subsidiary. It's a very quiet company. And as the chairman of Wesco, I have always delighted in saying that we have way less uh, human value in the executive staff than, uh, than Berkshire Hathaway does. Uh, it's a, it's a, what, what is it Daniel Webster said about Dartmouth, he says, small school, but there are those who love her. Well, West Coast is a small place, and uh, it's there in Berkshire is sort of a historical accident, but the, but the main current of, of Berkshire is right here in the Berkshire shares. Yeah, I don't know which one I would rather buy at present prices. I mean, I, I think it's, you could flip a coin. Uh, it, it, it does not have dramatically better growth potential just because it happens to sell at $200 a share instead of 38000 a share than, than Berkshire. I mean, the, I think the prospects probably are relatively close between the two. It, uh, um, and I, they're run by the same, same people pretty much, in, in, in effect. Charlie may spend a little more time on Wesco than, than I do, but uh, they're, they're, they've got the same prospects. But one problem that Wesco would have is that if people, and this is not a huge problem, but if people want to do a share exchange deal, they're going to want to do it probably with Berkshire rather than, than Wesco. At, uh, uh, Wesco, if we had small acquisitions in fields we knew, Wesco is a logical place to put them unless they happen to be in areas that Berkshire is already in. And for the really large things, uh, you know, Berkshire can do them and Wesco can't. But there's nothing, I don't think there's anything significantly superior or inferior about investment in Wesco compared to Berkshire. Well, the long run record of Berkshire is better. Yeah, it, it, the one thing, that it, it is a mistake to think that just because it's cheaper per share on a, a dollar price that it's, that it's got way more potential or anything, because that, that just isn't the case. It, it, a very large percentage of Wesco's value is represented by its interest in Freddie Mac. And, uh, um, a very large percentage of Berkshire's interest is represented, uh, Berkshire's value is represented by an interest in Coke, for example. Uh, so there, there, there's a different emphasis between the two places. Uh, I think Wesco owns some Coke and Berkshire owns some Freddie, but, but, but in different proportions. That's, that's an historical accident. That, uh, we'd love to see them both do well, obviously. There, there's another family that's in Wesco that we, we, we like a great deal, and, and we would hope that Wesco would perform as well or better than Berkshire. It, it, it's performed fine over the years, but it hasn't performed quite as well as, as, as Berkshire. Area three. Yes, hi. Hi, it's Jeff Hall from Toronto, Canada. Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, you're both a positive influence on all of us and our generations to come. There were a few significant individuals that had helped to guide your way in the beginning could you please share the current percentage of impact and evolution on your investment philosophy and approach between Graham Dodds, Graham and Dodds versus Philip Fisher and comment on each, please. Charlie, you want to, if you got it worked out there, well, Caliber. Warren, you, uh, you want that you tens of a percent or hundreds of a percent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were closer to... Uh, yeah, Ben Graham. Yeah, well, Ben. Yeah, th things would have happened. Good things would have happened uh, with following either party, irrespective of the other. Graham obviously had way more influence on me than than than, than Phil. But I worked for Ben. I went to school under him, uh, and his what I call the three basic ideas that uh, that. Uh, underlie successful investing, which is to look at 
stocks as businesses and to have the proper attitude toward the market and to operate with a margin of safety, they all come straight from Graham. I didn't think of any of those. And Phil Fisher opened my eyes more to the idea of trying to find the wonderful business. Charlie did more of that than Phil did, actually, so you'd have to put Charlie. But, but Phil was espousing that entirely, and, and, and I read his books in the late 50s or early 60s. So, you know, I, and Phil's still alive, as you know, and I, you know, I owe Phil a lot, but I, it doesn't compare to what I owe Graham, and, and uh, uh, that in no way reflects poorly on, on, on Phil. Ben was, ben was uh, one of a kind. John? Ben Graham was a truly formidable mind, and he also had a, a clarity in, in writing. And we've talked over and over again about the power of a few simple ideas thoroughly assimilated. And, uh, and that happened with, with Graham's ideas, which came to me indirectly uh, through Warren, but also some directly from Graham. The interesting thing for me is to watch Buffett, the former protege. And by the way, Buffett was the best student Graham had in 30 years of teaching at Columbia. And uh, but what happened, uh, and since I knew both men, was that Buffett became way better than Graham. That is a natural outcome. It's it's what Newton said. He said, if I've seen a little farther than other men, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. And uh, uh, so Warren may have stood on Ben's shoulders, but he ended up seeing, seeing farther. And no doubt somebody will come along in due course and do a lot better than we have. I enjoyed making money more than Ben. I mean, it, it, candidly, I mean, it, with Ben, it, it just... It, it really was incidental, at least it, by the time I knew him. It may have been different when he was younger, but it just didn't, it, the process didn't, enjoy, uh, of, of the whole game did not interest him more than a dozen other things may have interested him. With, with me, I just find it interesting. And, and, uh, and therefore, you know, I've spent, I've spent way more, a way higher percentage of my time thinking about investing and thinking about businesses. I, I probably thought way more about businesses than Ben ever did. It, he had he had other things that in, interested him. So, I've pursued the game a little, uh, quite a bit differently uh, than he did, and therefore, uh, measuring the record is really the two records are not. It's not a proper measurement. I mean, he he was he was uh, he was doing victory laps while I still thought I was out there running against you know the whole field. But well, Graham had some uh, blind spots partly of sort of an ethical professorial nature. He was looking for things to teach that would work for every man, that any intelligent layman could learn and do well. Well, if that's the limitation of what you're looking for, there'll be a lot of reality you won't go into because it's too hard to figure out and too hard to explain. Buffett, if there was money in it, uh, had no <laughs> such restriction. <laughs> Yeah, Ben. Ben sort of thought it was cheating if we went out and talked to the management because he just, he just felt that the person who read his book, you know, living in Pocatello, Idaho, could not go out and meet the management. So he, he didn't, he, he, and we didn't do it. I mean, when I worked for Graham, though, and it, it, I don't think I ever visited a management in in the 21 months I was there. He just, but you know, he, he wasn't sure whether it'd be useful anyway. But if it was be useful, you know, that that meant that his book was not. Uh, all that was needed, that you had to add something to it. I, I found it fun to go out and, and, and talk about their businesses with people or to check with competitors or suppliers or customers and all that. But uh, ben, didn't, ben didn't think there was anything wrong with that. He just, he just felt that if, if he had to do that, then his book was not the complete answer. And uh, uh, he didn't really want to do anything that the reader of his book couldn't do if he was on a desert island, you know, basically with just one line to a broker. <laughs> but if you stop to think about it, uh, Graham was trying to play the game of pen the donkey wearing very dark glasses, and Warren, of course, would use the biggest searchlight he could find. <laughs> <laughs> we still can't find any donkeys these days. Uh, okay, area one. 
I'm uh, Joe Knob from Seattle, a shareholder, uh, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. I wonder if you could uh, comment a little bit further on McDonald's carrying forward your, your comments of this morning, but uh, more oriented toward how the uh, McDonald's would stack up against the inevitables in uh, uh, international type business, what your vision would be on, on their growth potential in uh, places like Germany, China, so on and so forth. Yeah, I guess I just would have to stick with my comment that, that you won't get the inevitability in, in food that you will get in a single consumer product, um, you know, such as, such as blades. I mean, it, it, if I'm using a Gillette sensor blade today, the chances are I'll, I'll try the next generation that comes out It'll be the sensor Excel right now, but if I, I will, I, I will try the next one that comes out, obviously, but I will not fool around at all in between. And 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 a very high percentage of people that shave, including women uh, in shaving, they're happy with the product. You know, it's it's not it's not expensive. It's twenty odd dollars a year. You know, if if you're a typical user, and if you're getting a great result, you're not going to fool around. Whereas a great many of the decisions on fast food as to where you eat is simply based on which one you see. I mean, convenience is a huge factor. So if you are going by a McDonald's or a Burger King or a Wendy's uh, and you happen to be hungry at that point, or if you're traveling on the road and you see one of those signs up, you're probably going to stop at the, uh, you may very well stop at the one you see. Uh, so there's, there is not the, there's a loyalty factor, but it, but it's, it's, it's just not going to be the, the same in food. People want to vary their, I don't, I mean, I'm happy to eat every day, but, but most people want to vary what, where, they, where they eat as they, as they uh, uh, go through the, uh, the week or the, the month or the year. And, and they don't really have any great desire to vary their, their soft drink the same way. It just, it, it's, not the, it's not the same thing. But, uh, so. There's no knock on McDonald's at all. It's just the nature of the of the kind of kind of industry there. And uh, Charlie, I can't think of anybody else who, before McDonald's, ever did what McDonald's did to create a chain of restaurants on such a scale uh, that 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 worked. Oh, Howard Johnson's tried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a lot of failures. Or uh, some of you are old enough around Omaha to remember Reed's. Harkerts or Harker, Harkets, hamburgers, Harkerts. Harkets, wholesome hamburgers. Right, and, and they Three came and, and they went. Those those chains, and uh, but the it is a much tougher business that McDonald's is in. It's price sensitive too. I mean, obviously, it, uh, part of that's comparative. You can you could spend a lot more money on hamburgers in the course of a year than razor blades. I mean, you can't save that much by changing razor blades. Yeah, the average person will buy 27 in the United States, 27 sensor excels a year. You know, that's one every roughly 13 days. And uh, I don't know what the retail price is because they give them free to us as directors. But uh, the, you know, if they're a dollar, it's 27 bucks. I mean, and and and. Uh, it makes a lot of difference. That, that's what's happening, of course, around the world is people that are using cheap double-edged blades or whatever is they, they keep moving up the comfort scale and their comfort uh, ladder. And, and, and Gillette is a direct beneficiary of that. And it's, the difference between having great shaves and very so-so shaves and lots of nicks and scratches and everything is 10 bucks a year or 12 bucks a year. I mean, that, that, that is not, that's not going to cause many people to change there. Their habits and uh, uh, incidentally, the sensor for women has just been a huge success. That, that uh, uh, I think they've had more more razors go out on that than, than the same period when the original sensor was came out for men. That, uh, uh, so that's that, that's been an enlargement of the market. I would not have guessed that would have worked that well before that. All the women just uh, use the disposables or 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 their their husband's boyfriend's razor, but. Thank God they've gotten over that. <laughs> Area two. Gentlemen, my name is Ted Downey. I live in Mankato, Minnesota. 
Mr. Munger, your reference to Einstein, I happen to have an article called Strange is Our Situation Here on Earth, which is somewhat related to my question. This morning you brought up the shortcomings of accountability, and I would like you to address uh, the aspects of the environmental impact uh, in our accounting system and how this might relate to a social screen for uh, investment in uh, other areas. Well, again, that is broad enough and tough enough so that uh, I, I think I should pass. Uh, yeah. I, the, the, uh, I would say the, the, the unseen hand or the invisible hand, you know, does not work perfectly for, for all aspects of, uh, of uh, an economy. Uh, the, so, but I, in terms of accounting for it, uh, in terms of an individual balance sheet or income account, you know, that, that, that would be way beyond me. But, but there are things that the invisible hand won't do, and therefore that unfettered market-driven economic action will not lead to the best result for society, in my view. I think the market works awfully well in, an awfully, in a tremendous number of ways. It produces what people want and increasing quantities, and it, 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 it uh, you know, it's enormously beneficial to have a market-driven society, but, it, but a pure market-driven society will do things that uh, uh, will have antisocial consequences. And you, you certainly need environmental rules. Yeah. The pioneers died like flies because the drinking water was too near the sewage. And, uh, and one of the glories of the world we live in now is that the sewage systems are so good. And you know, you don't think about it much, but it's dramatically changed our prospects and, uh, and uh, the general quality of, of how we live. And there are a lot of other places where you need environmental rules. Uh, all that said, some of the environmental stuff has gone way too far, but it's too complicated to try and draw pre precise lines. Area three. My name is Gul Asnani. I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I have a question uh, concerning page four of the annual report where you talk about the investments for share, etc. Right. And my question is, how much claim do the operating business has have on these marketable securities? Yeah, well, that table's a very important table in my view, and we measure our progress to some extent by the figures in both columns of that table, one of which shows the investments per share and the other shows the operating earnings from everything other than investments. And the operating businesses have first claim on anything that relates to their business. I mean, it's... It, if C's is going to, to buy a new plant, which it probably is now, or buy an additional building, I shouldn't say a new plant, you know, that, that comes first. They, uh, the business is growing, it'll produce some economies and all that. We do that, you know, we try and do it as intelligently as possible, but that comes first. The, that doesn't use but a small fraction of the capital. All of those needs don't use but a small fraction of the capital that uh, Berkshire will generate. The investments reside largely in insurance companies because that's where largely the liquid funds are. Uh, they have to have capital strength, obviously, because they have huge promises outstanding. But where they reside does not determine who manages them. Lou Simpson manages Geico's portfolio specifically, but in effect, Charlie and I manage everything else. So where they, where they, where they precisely reside really makes no difference. I mean, they're, if they, if they, they're sitting someplace, they're not for the operating management to use in, 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 in projects that are far afield from what they're doing. But if they need money in any operating business, you know, we'll have a check there that day. The flight safety, for example, will be a fairly capital intensive business. I mean, it, if our project with Boeing goes as we hope it goes, uh, you know, we'll there will be substantial money in there because there, you know, we will have 
many more simulators uh, around the world, uh, and we'll be paying our proportional cost of it. Uh, but they don't need to keep money around to prepare for that day, which they would if they were a standalone operation. Uh, we can, money's fungible, we can deploy it all the time, and whenever anybody needs it, we'll come up with it, but we don't, we don't leave it around awaiting the day when some specific operation needs it. Charlie? The odds are very good that the marketable securities will keep going up even as the businesses expand. That's the way the game has worked in the past, and we hope it'll keep going that way. What we are doing is trying to increase the numbers in both columns. We don't have any, we don't have any favoritism for this over that or anything of the sort, but we're looking all the time for things that will do, will, will help both, both columns. And we'd be disappointed if five or ten years from now that they both haven't increased significantly. But which, which column will increase at the greater rate, we don't know. Area one. Good day. Uh, my name is John Zvanovich from Ottawa, Canada, uh, which incident incidentally has nothing to do with BREEX whatsoever. Um, my question more goes back to uh, the discussion of intellectual capital, in particular, perhaps your intellectual reserves. Uh, in, in so speaking of uh, security analysts, the first edition in 1934, Ben Graham talked about the development of the new era theory and its consequences on the security business. Uh, in today's terms, we see a lot of the same words and uh, phrases being repeated by analysts on Wall Street. And with the historical returns on common stocks dating back to the 1800s coming in at about 7%, uh, pair that together with the concept of regression to the mean and statistics, um, do you not think that we're in a very dangerous period? Well, the, the answer, we never know. I mean, we, we, in terms of what markets will do, we, I don't think that the Coca-Cola company's in a dangerous position, you know, in a dangerous era, or, or Gillette is in a dangerous era, or McDonald's, or Wells Fargo, or whatever, but, uh, or Seeds Candy, or the businesses we own in their entire, Kirby, whatever it may be. Uh, whether valuations are too high gets back to the question that we we said or we talked about earlier. If, if for businesses in aggregate they keep earning very high returns on equity and interest rates stay where they are, we are not in an overvalued period. If it turns out that these returns are not sustainable or interest rates go higher, it will, we will look back and say this was a high point, but for at least for a while. But we have no notion on that, and and we really don't think about it. Uh, Basically, we because we, we don't know. You know, we, our job is to focus on things that we can know and that make a difference. And if something can't make a difference or we can't know it, you know, we write that one off. So uh, we're looking for the. the so Warren, you would expect average returns from stock market index type investing to regress somewhat down. Well, oh, I don't think the, what I don't, they've been the last few years. I don't think you'll get the investment result from owning the S&P over the next 10 years that you've gotten over the past 10 years. I would, I would if someone wanted to put some real money on that, uh, they would find a taker with me. Uh, you know, that, that's very unlikely to happen. That's not predicting a crash. It's no, just saying no. that the guaranteed result from the next 10 years is almost certain to be less than yeah, out of the last. It wouldn't I mean, it, uh, this is in no way predictable. But I mean, it wouldn't surprise us in the least if stocks average 4% a year, you know, for the next 10 years. That, that doesn't mean they will, or we don't, we don't know the number. But that, that, is, that would not be a surprising outcome. And it wouldn't bother us particularly either. And, uh, Charlie, what? No. Two? Hello. My name is Larry Whitman from Minot, North Dakota. You have both talked today about the shrinking universe of stocks you could purchase, less margin of safety than ever, and a higher opportunity cost. And you've also talked about looking to uh, potentially purchase your great companies that you already have at reasonable prices. And so I wonder if by talking so positively about some of your stocks, in particular Disney, 
um, such as in the 95 annual report when you talked about actually um, telling everyone that you were buying more shares on the open market, and again at the 97 meeting, uh, at their meeting when you talked about uh, maybe not uh, selling the shares. Those were both opportunities maybe when uh, Disney may have dropped because of such things as increased debt or even people's concerned about the uh, Ovitz compensation package. And I just wonder if uh, that may hurt your ability to buy these great companies at reasonable prices by talking so positively about them when in fact maybe you could buy them at lower prices when people get irrational. Yeah, you're saying that, which I probably agree with it, if we would say the world is going to hell at Coke or Disney or Gillette, we might be better off in terms of being able to buy more stock. But, uh, you know, I got asked a question at Disney and I answered it and that, that's my general approach that I think it's, I think it's usually a bad mistake to, to to sell your interest in wonderful businesses. I don't think people find them that often, and I think they they get hung up if they've sold them at X that they want to buy them back at 90% of X or 85% of X, so they'll never go back in at 105% of X. So I, just, I, I think on balance, if you are in a business that you understand and you think it's a really outstanding business, that the presumption should be that you just hold it and don't worry. And if it goes down 25% in price or 30% in price, if you have more money available, buy more. And if you don't, you know, so what? Just look at the business and, and judge how it's doing. Uh, uh, but there's no question. I mean, we don't. We try not to talk very much about about the businesses, except maybe to use them as an illustration in a teaching mode or something. That sort. We're not touting anything. And I did try to stick those precautions in when I do talk about them as being wonderful businesses so people don't take it as an unqualified buy recommendation or something of the sort. But we're not, we, we won't try and put any spin on any, on it when we're talking about business generally. We may not talk about them at all. Uh, you know, if we're buying something, we're, we're, we might be, that particularly if no one knows that we've been in that stock at all, we might be somewhat uh, quiet about the fact. But. Uh, um, we don't. We don't want to. We don't want to talk down something uh, in order to buy it, Charlie. Well, I always, uh, Jerry Newman, as I understand it, didn't like Ben Graham giving all these courses explaining what Newman and Graham were doing. And uh, but Graham's attitude was that he was a professor first, and, and if he made just slightly less money by being very accurate in what he taught, why well, so be it. And I think it's fair to say that Warren is assimilated a bit of that ethos and uh, I think it's all to the good and if it costs us a tiny little bit of money from time to time they're probably compensating benefits and if there aren't it's probably the right way to behave anyway Charlie if you were in a less charitable move by point out I didn't behave that way till I got rich <laughs> actually I, I used to teach a course at, at uh, what was then the University of Omaha and we used all these current examples but and things were so cheap there, but nobody paid any attention. Uh, area three. Hello, Mr. Munger and Mr. Buffett. My name is Liza Rima from Burbank, California. Um, I wanted to find out, um, earlier you mentioned you looked at, uh, you used filters to look at a company. So could you elaborate on what those filters are? Charlie, you wanna? Well, we've tried to do a good deal of that, and Opportunity cost is a is a huge filter in life. If you've got two suitors who are really eager to have you, and one is way the hell better than the other, you do not have to spend much time with the other. And uh, and that's the way we filter stock buying opportunities. Our ideas are so simple. People keep asking us for mysteries when all we have is the most elementary idea. Yeah, the first the first filter we probably put it through is whether we think, it, what, and we know instantly, I mean, whether it's a business we're going to understand and whether it's a business that if, if that, if it passes through that, it's whether a company can have a sustainable edge, you know, and th that gets rid of a very significant percentage of the things people have. They always want to tell you some story or anything, and I'm sure they regard, regard me and Charlie as very arbitrary in terms of, you know, in the middle of the first sentence, 
saying, well, you know, we appreciate the call, but we're not interested. I mean, they, you know, they just think if they explain something, and if I get letters on this all the time, and, but we, we really can tell in the middle of the first sentence usually whether those two factors exist. And if we can't understand it, obviously it's not going to have, we can't make a decision as to whether it has a sustainable edge. And if we can't understand it, we very often can come to the conclusion that, that it's not the kind of business where it will have a sustainable edge. So 98% of the conversations we can, we can end you know, in the middle of somebody's first sentence, which of course goes over very big with the caller, but. Um, <laughs> and then sometimes if you're talking about an entire business, we can tell by, we can tell by who we're dealing with whether a deal's ever gonna work out or not. I mean, it, it, uh, if there's an auction going on, we don't wanna, we, we have no interest in talking about it. And, and uh, uh, it, it just isn't gonna, you know, it isn't gonna work if someone is interested in, in essentially doing that with their business, you know, they're going to sit down or want to renegotiate everything with us all over again after the deal is done, and we're going to have to buy the business two or three times before we get through. It, it, you, just, you just see all these things coming. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we've had, you know, terrific experience, basically, with the people we, we have associated with. So it works. It's efficient. You know, we don't want to listen to stories all day. And... Uh, we don't read brokerage reports or anything of this sort. It's just, it, they're just, there's other things to do with your time. Charlie? Yeah. Another of filter that Warren was alluding to is this concept of the quality person. And of course, most people define quality person as somebody very much like themselves. And, but. Identical, actually, is the word we are searching for. <laughs> But there's so many wonderful people out there, and there's so many awful people out there, and there's certain, and there's signs frequently, like flags, particularly over the awful people, and generally speaking, those people are to be avoided. It just the amount of misery you bring into your life by trusting some awful person, and the amount of felicity that you can bring in by making the right business associations. Look around this room, and there are some wonderful people who have created some wonderful businesses, and, and their customers can trust them, the employees can trust them, uh, the problems can trust them to, to, to be uh, fairly faced and reasonably solved. And those are the kind of people you want to, and, and, uh, and people will take their promises seriously. Uh, I. Uh, had some experience recently with a company and they have their brand on a particular product and somebody invented a better product in the same field and they're taking their brand off their, their product. I mean, if it isn't the best, they don't want their brand on it. Uh, people who think like that frequently do very well in business and, and, and the flags are flying. Yeah. I mean, you, you, the, it's like they got a sign in their chest that just says jerk, jerk, jerk. And then yeah. and then you think you're gonna buy the business and they aren't gonna be a jerk, you know, anymore. I mean it, yeah, it just right. <laughs> right. Right. It. Okay, area one. Hi, David Winters, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, shareholder. Um, I'm just wondering if there's an organizational model where you deal with the plethora of information so you can physically and intellectually organize it so you have um, your maximum output and retain focus. And secondly, if I may, in the domestic soft drink business, is it winner take all? I mean, is there room for three competitors? And honestly, does Dr. Pepper have a future? Yeah, I would say Dr. Pepper has a future. I'll, I'll answer the second one. But sure, there's room for more than one. I think Coke's market share will go up pretty much year after year, but not, you know, we're talking tenths of a percent in that business, but tenths of a percent are important. Uh, uh, the U.S. market is what uh, uh, must be uh, 10 billion cases. So you know, one percent is 100 million cases. But, uh, um, there will be D D Dr. Pepper appeals to a lot of people. It's interesting how regional tastes can be. I mean, a, a Dr. Pepper will have a share in, in Texas that's you know far higher than it will be in, in, in Minnesota or something. But uh, but they're, 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 gonna, they're people that are going to prefer it. And, and uh, 
The interesting thing, though, is that the high percentage of people that, that prefer cola, for example, uh, although the cola percentages have gone down a little bit, the fastest growing big beverage at, at, at Coke is Sprite. Sprite has had huge gains in, in, uh, in, in sales. It, it does well over a billion cases a year, and it sells very well in a whole bunch of countries. That, uh, um, so they'll, you can make money with a soft drink company that doesn't dominate the business. You'll do a lot better with one that does dominate, but it, it's not a winner-take-all. It's not like, not like two newspapers in a, in a, in a town of 100,000 or 200,000. Uh, uh, there are certain businesses that are winner-take-all, uh, clearly, but soft drinks are uh, not one of them. What was the first question? Oh, the part about organizing. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering, um, for those of us on the other side of the table, we get barraged with information, and I'm wondering how, how do you both, do you just read annuals, 10Ks, and talk to people, and ignore everything else, and how do you keep track of everything, intellectually? Yeah. Well, we don't keep track of everything, but, but the, the beauty of, to some extent, of evaluating businesses, large businesses, is that it is all cumulative. I mean, if you, if you started doing it 40 or so years ago, you really have got a working knowledge of an awful lot of businesses, but there aren't that many to start with that are, you know, and, and you, you, you can get a fix, you know, I'm, what are there, 75 maybe or so important industries, and you'll get to understand how they operate, and you don't have to start over again every day, uh, and you don't have to consult a computer for it or anything like that. It, so it has the advantage of, of uh, accumulation of useful information over time and you know you, you just add the incremental bit at some point you know why did we decide to buy coca-cola in 1988 well it may have been you know just a couple small incremental bits of information but that came into a mass that had been accumulated over over decades and uh it's a very it, it's a great business that way it's why we like businesses that don't change too much because the past is useful to us charlie i can't add a thing to that over there on two. I'm Barbara Morrow from Wisconsin and New York. If you both live as long as I believe you will, it could happen that there'll be a year when you write two big checks for super cat claims when the market is throwing away things at really silly prices. Could you share your thinking about uh, how much debt you would consider taking on to buy great businesses as cheap in that kind of a situation? Well, if we, if we had both a big hurricane in the Northeast or in Florida, and we had a big quake in California in the same year, and we had a financial market, uh, the financial markets tanked perhaps because of those events, but perhaps for other reasons, uh, we would... Uh, we would be thinking about ways, it might not be borrowing money directly, but we, we would be thinking about ways to, uh, to buy uh, uh, securities if they got cheap enough. I mean, anytime securities get cheap, Charlie, you're thumping again here. Uh, anytime securities get cheap, uh, you know, we, it, we don't like to go to the office and not write a ticket. I mean, that, so uh, we, we certainly would have the ability to borrow some money. We, we would never borrow a ton of money relative to, to uh, capital. We're just not set out that way. We don't want to disappoint anybody in this world. We don't even want to worry about disappointing anybody in this world. So we're not going to do that. But we've got a lot. We have a lot of extra firepower uh, uh, overall. And uh, I would say under almost any conditions that cause securities to get very cheap, we would find a way to buy some of them. But, uh, Charlie? The beauty of our situation is that it has enormous flexibility built into it. If something were large enough and cheap enough, we could stop writing super cats. Uh, we're measuring opportunities one against the other, and we understand the way the numbers interplay. And uh, so we have a lot of different options. And that's a huge advantage. There's so many places in business life where you have practically no options at all. You're just in a channel that you have to waltz down the channel and you don't have any options to do anything else. 
we have enormous options we may not exercise them but we have enormous flexibility yeah we know they're there and yeah and there's no reason to push on anything now at least we don't see we don't have any reason to push ourselves but it, if if it ever became advantageous to push somewhat we would push, although never to a degree that in any way caused us to lose a minute of sleep about fulfilling every obligation we had. It's 3.30. I thank you all for coming. I look forward to seeing you next year and so on. Thank you.